Okay, we are live. Thank you, Derek. Harley, you're sitting in a sunbeam. Looks good on you. Okay, I think it is five o'clock and I believe we're ready to go. We have all of our staff are here and our council. So welcome everyone to this evening's uh, plan, uh, planning public meeting. We have two uh, parts to this planning meeting this afternoon. And, but I did want to welcome everyone, uh, our presenters. We've got a number of people who want to share their opinions with us this afternoon, which is great and our staff and our viewing public that are joining us uh, through uh, mefordca slash YouTube. So welcome all. We are here together today to learn about proposed changes to the municipal official plan. The Planning Act requires that our municipality consider the need to revisit the official plan every five years. And so it's now time to proceed with that update. The act requires that the municipality hold a public meeting to obtain input on the revisions to the official plan that may be required as part of a comprehensive review. Today, we'll hear about the proposed scope of changes to the official plan and welcome all members of the public who are here today to provide comment on what they feel is important to be included in these revisions. Everyone in attendance may have the opportunity to speak if they wish to do so. We encourage them to share your thoughts about the proposed changes to the official plan either that you like or that you don't like. And uh, we're happy to accept any, any questions that you may have as well. So with that, noting that we do have all of our uh, um, councillors in attendance and staff, I will uh, call this public meeting to order. It uh, is a public meeting of the municipality of Meaford to consider revisions that may be required to the official plan under section 26.3 of the Planning Act prior to revising the official plan as part of the required five-year review. So as I call this meeting to order, I will ask you all to join me in a moment of reflection as we consider the business before us. Thank you. Um, is there any disclosure, uh, disclosure of interest, either pecuniary or general interest from anyone on council? And seeing none, knowing that uh, you can so declare at any time. And um, we will now begin with this meeting as a mandatory part of the planning process, which has been set out by the Planning Act. Uh, based on the rules in the Act, there must be at least 30 days notice given to residents with, in this regard. Notice was issued on April the 7th, 2021, giving more than the 30 days notice. So off we go. First, I will ask our CAO and Director of Development Services, Rob Armstrong, to please summarize any uh, public and agency comments that have been received and to provide us with a presentation re related to the official plan review. So over to you, Rob. Yes, thank you, Worship. Um, I will start by just highlighting uh, some of the preliminary uh, comments that we have received. I'll just highlight the names of those uh, that have submitted. Um, uh, Louise and Tony Buccella, Karen Coleman, Bill Courage, Virginia Ellis, Leslie Lewis, Sonia Mount, Ken Martin, um, Andrew Pascuzzo and Parkridge Lifestyle Communities, Nancy Premack, Lori Shifley, Linda Stevens, Jim Sullivan, and Paul Young. Uh, those we have received written confirmation, uh, or sorry, written uh, submissions on behalf of the OP review. 
Um, I will note uh, through the presentation at the end of the presentation that uh, people can continue advising or ad identifying issues uh, for the official plan review process, uh, as this is the initial kickoff meeting uh, uh, for that process, just to identify how people can engage. So, so if uh, Derek could uh, call up the presentation, I'll quickly run through uh, the presentation and highlight um, those matters. Um, so yeah, this is the official plan update 2021. Um, this is our second kick at the cat with regard to uh, the public meeting. We tried and had a scheduled public meeting back last March uh, 2020. However, due to uh, the impacts of COVID, uh, we had to cancel that and have been working uh, to get this back up and running. So we're glad to be able to uh, have this uh, initial kickoff meeting uh, today. Uh, next slide, please. So we always like to start off uh, and just quantify or elaborate what is land use planning and, and the terms that many planners bring forward in defining what land use planning is. It's, it has a technical, a political and a social aspect uh, of a process by which a community defines and acts to attain its preferred quality of life. So it's, it's establishing those policies to really drive those key elements. Uh, Planners who are the ones that put planning or the official plans together and put them forward to councils for consideration. Uh, it's our role and responsibility to achieve an orderly disposition of land and resources to protect both the physical, the economic and social health of, of communities. So that's the one of the key roles of official plan and what we put forward. Uh, I spoke about planners and who we are. Uh, a planner is a reg is registered uh, professional planner through the Ontario Professional Planners Institute that has met educational, experiential, and ethical standards in relation to their practice. That basically speaks to the advice that we are giving to councils in consideration of, of official plans um, and how we act. So glad to be able to just quantify that. Next slide. We operate under a, a planning system that's really driven by the province of Ontario. And, and a various number of documents that uh, we as the, the lower tier municipality must adhere to uh, all those matters above us. So we have the Planning Act of Ontario, the provincial policy statement, a local official plan, an upper tier official plan, zoning bylaws, which are the implementation tool and other tools, which I'll explain on individual slides. So we can go to the next slide. So the Planning Act provides the legislative framework for, for land use planning in all of Ontario. Some of the things it sets out is how the system works, who the decision makers are, so who makes decisions on official plans, zoning bylaws, plans of subdivision. It also speaks to how re, uh, disputes get resolved. So what is the uh, mechanism for uh, considering matters where there's disagreement and how the public can provide input through various means. Um, it also allows the Minister of Municipal Affairs to have policy statements and further define key provincial land use planning interests. Um, and then there's a number of other things that have come forward through various bills that are highlighted in here, such as the More Homes, More Choices Act, uh, the Better uh, Building Better Communities and Conserving Watersheds, the Economic Recovery Act, Planning Act amendments that were done in 29, and then the repeal of acts also applies where we build policies in that are no longer applicable and that applies in the case of the Green Energy Act. So next slide. The provincial policy statements uh, is uh, issued under the authority of section three of the Planning Act and it provides directions of provincial matters that we must consider when we do up our, do our official plan. Um, it promotes a provincial policy led planning system uh, the most recent was updated in 2020. So considering our official plan last update was 2014, we do have to consider those matters on the go forward. All deficient decisions affecting planning matters must be or shall be consistent with the policy statements issued under the Planning Act. So as staff make recommendations um, to council on matters, we have to be satisfied that they are consistent with the provincial policy statements. Um, the province also has a number of additional guidance documents that we consider, such as MDS, minimum distance separation from livestock, uh, permitted uses on prime agricultural areas, amongst other matters. So, next slide. 
official plans and what they do. Um, so they provide a description of how you bring the provincial policies down to both the county and the local scale. Uh, they start out very general and then they get implemented through local official plans and county official plans. They will express objectives and policies to guide both short and long-term physical development of lands within the municipality. And I spoke to that social, economic, and environmental matters as it relates to those two. It's a policy document with some flexibility in the application of its policies that will require interpretation from staff and making recommendations to council. Uh, it also puts into action implementation tools such as the zoning bylaw, subdivision and site plan control matters, and other cap things through capital budgets and expansions and things like that within the municipality that we need to consider. Anytime the municipality undertakes public works, it must conform to the applicable official plan policies. Um, this includes matters such as uh, if we were putting a walkway through a class, uh, a, a provincially significant wetland and the, and the provincial policy says you can't do that, then that's a conflict. So we wouldn't be able to do that. So we just have to make sure that whenever we do public works that they must comply with the official plan. Next slide. Um, the official plan is broke out into mapping um, and then text to go explain the mapping in a large degree. Mapping places uh, lands within a different category that will have policies on how they can be developed. It will also include road networks, constraint mapping, such as environmental protected lands uh, that meet, must be considered or adhered to in, when developing. And also concern, uh, the text portion contains written objectives and policies regarding the development of land. So the rules of the game when you uh, proceed with development are all contained within an official plan. Next slide. Um, the official plan status, uh, county and local. So the County of Grey official plan uh, was adopted in 2018 and approved by the province in 2019 and uh, under their process called Recolor Grey. So as we move through our official plan, uh, we will have to conform uh, to the County of Grey official plan. Uh, we can't be more uh, permissive, uh, but we can, uh, we can be more restrictive than the county plan official plan as we go. Official plans are to be updated, reviewed on a regular basis, uh, every year, 10 years following a new official plan and every five years thereafter. Um, the municipality of Meaford was mostly re-updated in 2013, approved in 2014, and therefore an update is required at this time. Uh, the lower tier official plan must generally be brought into conformity with the upper tier plan, the county plan, as I mentioned, within one year. Our review is initially scheduled, as I noted, um, however, due to the delay, it's, it's been posting years, so we, we do have to get going with this for sure. Next slide. So some of the milestones, um, we have a kickoff special meeting uh, that uh, is occurring tonight. Uh, the key objective of, of the public meeting is to outline the process to which we will undertake the official plan. It, it's going to be over a probably about a year's time uh, in the workings. Uh, there'll be many opportunities throughout that process for public consultation, including some very focused public meeting. It's also to hear of those, to identify to the public those items that we believe as staff uh, that we've heard over the years of those matters that require updating, as well as hear from the public, if there, is there any other matter that we need to, uh, to hear about. It's not to actually debate the actual policies, it's more just to say, we think you need to look at this particular item and then that process will follow out through the, the next little bit. Uh, we retain a, pl a professional planning consultant and I'm happy to report that uh, we have selected the Niagara Planning Group. Uh, they're actually listening in on the call tonight. Uh, or this afternoon and, and listening to the, uh, the presentation and the public comments. Uh, so they are here uh, and we'll be kicking off this process very shortly. Uh, the policy and document, so a background report that will look at all of the existing policies, identify those uh, that need to be updated for, for various reasons that I'll be going through, um, as well as uh, speaking to a process to do that. There'll be a preparation of draft policy changes, options, and mapping, which will form the basis of the public engagement session, which will be the next stage, which we hope to do through some kitchen table planning work, uh, workbooks, 
surveys. We're going to have a serious a series of public focus group workshops. So an example, we know there's a particular interest in the agricultural rural area with regard to uh, additional uses and, and that that have come up through the process. So our intent is to have a session particularly focused on, on that. We know that the downtown urban character is, is a particular issue. So we'll have a focus group on that and allow people who have a special interest on, on certain topics to attend those and, and have that dialogue and discussion on what they believe should be applicable. There'll be the preparation of the draft plan uh, update uh, that will also include a solicitation. Um, obviously we have to work with uh, a number of provincial agencies as well, as well as the county in the development of those plans. So we'll be submitting to them for comment. We'll have a formal consultation. So another open house and then the statutory public meeting where comments will need to be received with regard to the actual proposed policies. And then if all goes well, hopefully adoption of the official plan by council and then off to Gray County, who is the approval authority of the official plan. Next slide and we'll get to some uh, timeline dates for these uh, documents. So um, from now until uh, the end of June, that background research and report preparation will be worked on by the consultant in consultation with staff. Uh, June through November, uh, we'll be drafting the policies and mapping presentation. And starting in August, uh, we'll be starting those public workshops and engagements, um, October, August through October 21. Following that, uh, the drafting of the official plan update will occur with the formal statutory consultation and public meetings to occur February through April. Uh, that to be confirmed considering everything uh, as it moves along. We're hoping for a target date of adoption of the official plan in April or May of next year. And then following that, obviously off to the county for approval and depending on the issues uh, that come forward and the uh, agency consultation, uh, whether we have to consider further changes or not, uh, that will be determined, but it's off to the county for approval at that point. Next slide. So we broke the scope of issues into 10 different categories. Um, I spoke that our official plan must comply with the County of Gray official plan. Uh, so that's item number one that we have. Employment land supply uh, to ensure the economic viability of the community. We have to ensure we have enough economic or employment lands for the development. Uh, so that will be a consideration. The legislative changes I spoke to, municipal plans and initials, we've prepared a number of, of municipal plans that we have to roll into the official plan. Greenfield development and infrastructure. So we have a number of undeveloped urban areas that require further consideration. I spoke to the rural character and rural settlement area policies, the urban character and urban settlement area policies, the heritage and archeological elements, two zone policies and the technical and other. And what I'll do is I'll expand on these on the next slide. So next slide, please. So looking at county official plan conformity, we've identified, and I don't, won't go through all of these, but because uh, it, it has been up there, but these are a number of the items that we will need to account for as we go through our official plan, including updated growth management stuff uh, items, uh, municipal servicing policies, updates to the agricultural and special ag, elements, updated constraint uh, mapping. A lot of work has been done on the natural heritage system uh, protection uh, as a systems, as opposed to just uh, an individual item. So things like that will need to be incorporated uh, as part of the OP review relating to the county official plan. Next slide. Employment land supply, I spoke to that. Uh, we have a large area in the municipality identified it for employment. So we just need to look at that, making sure the amount of land deals with our supply. Um, we might need to consider some alterations in the uh, Helen Sykes Street area to allow certain employment uses as based on their proximity to residential. Um, we need to consider the removal of the Ed some Edwin Street properties, the old Knights uh, property, which is in the middle of a residential area and really not set up for long-term uh, industrial type uses. So we need to consider the redesignation of those lands. And then our key industrial park area, Muir and Gray Road 7, just how that uh, it's designated for employment slough, but how does that pan out? So those are some of the employment land supplies and uh, things we need to deal with. Next slide. The legislation changes. Um, I spoke to some of those other matters. We've got an updated PPS, uh, Bill 108, the, as it relates to community benefits charges. Um, right now, our current official plan under section, 30 spe section, section 37 speaks to bonusing provisions 
that has been removed from the Planning Act and, and has been replaced by community benefit charges um, applicable to any development over four stories and greater than 10 units. Uh, so we will need to update our official plan and remove the bonusing provisions and consider whether we look at a community benefits charge if applicable. Uh, we have some aggregate acts changes I mentioned the Green Energy Act, it's been repealed. Our official plan has a lot of policies relation to that. So we will need to look at that and whether we need to guide future amendments. Uh, the old Green Energy Act removed any municipality's ability to have policies related to large scale energy projects. With that repeal, there might be consideration required to bring back policies in relation to that. And any other legislation changes that come forward. Next slide. Municipal plans initiative, I mentioned that we're, we've done a lot of uh, different uh, elements within uh, the municipality since our official plan. We've got a, some affordable housing reports that we need to bring forward, development charges background study, which we've, uh, we're working on right now. The transportation master plan, which will be coming to council very shortly, has elements to be incorporated in the official plan. The facility rationalization, uh, community safety and well-being plan will have elements that will need to be folded into the official plan. The Memorial Park Master Plan uh, elements will need to be incorporated. The, our economic development strategy spoke about the official plan process, considering a vision for this community. Uh, so that will be part of the official plan elements. Council strategic priorities need to be accounted for in the official plan. We do have an open road allowance policy approach that we're considering uh, in relation to whether we retain or, or sell lands as well as well and waterline encroachment policies approach. Uh, we have a number of water lines, shore wells across roads, and, and we just need to take a look approach and establishing policies in relation to that. So those are some of the municipal plans initiatives that we'll need to account for. Next slide. Uh, greenfield development infrastructure. So we have some areas within the community that are designated, have historically been designated for development but are unserviced, do not have full municipal services, which provides a constraint. Uh, in servicing those lands, we have to ensure that the cost to service those lands uh, and the amount of development related to that uh, will be accounted for. And, and in that regard, we will need to consider whether we establish special policy areas or I treat them as a secondary plan with minimum density policies for these areas to ensure that they can be serviced uh, in the long run. Uh, so that will be part of the official plan review process. Next slide. Uh, rural character and settlement areas. Um, we need to, uh, we've heard a lot about the values of our rural area and whether uh, there's conflicts and uh, how we should protect the rural area and uh, the whole issue of on-farm diversified and rural uh, flexibility. And so that will need to be considered as part of that official pl plan. Um, we have to update some kennel provisions uh, and then also review policies around farm help accommodations um, for in support of the agriculture community. As we've worked through those policies over the years, we've noticed some challenges and, and they could be updated to facilitate the agriculture community. So that's uh, some of the rural and agricultural uh, policy updates. Next slide. Urban character and settlement area. As I mentioned, we need to update the vision. Our uh, in the plan with regard to our settlement area, uh, that will include significant public consultation because we need to hear from the community what is our vision, what is the vision for the downtown core, uh, we, we've got a designated heritage area and how that applies, as well as we have some transitional areas. So those areas are between, are between the residential uh, and the commercial downtown and, and what really is at, uh, at play for them because we did put them in a downtown core transitional area in the last official plan, but we've seen some challenges with that implementation, so we need to do that. We know that um, the Georgian Bay Community School and the nearby Aiken Street property will be surplus by the uh, school board, so we need to go through a process and consider the long-term uh, aspects of those uh, uses and whether they require uh, redesignation um, as we go through this process. Next slide. Heritage, um, so we need to reflect some of the ministry screening from our, our archeological potential uh, within the official plan. We also need to ensure there's uh, consistency between the official plan policies and our heritage conservation district plan and the, the way that the advisory committee structure uh, is in place and how that functions. 
it was to all the policies in place now were all done before the Heritage Conservation District plan and, and the committee was set up. So we need to consider that and update those changes uh, within the official plan policies. And the municipalities also has uh, proposed for this year an update to the Heritage Conservation District plan. So we'll try to deal with those simultaneously so that there is consistency among both documents. Next slide. So two zone policies. So um, this was a, a municipality is allowed to establish a two zone approach where you have a flood way and a flood fringe. Um, we went through a study, a two zone policy study within uh, along the Big Head River um, on the south side of Trowbridge Street um, the, and established policies for, for that area. We also know that there's an additional two zone area that's being looked at in relation to Peach Creek and the flooding uh, on Peach Creek. Peach Creek is um, uh, in the north end of the urban area. Um, it crosses, I would say, the, uh, the uh, Sykes Street in around the Ultramar gas station, um, right by the, the sewage pumping station on Sykes Street. So that's where Peach Creek comes out. So it's that water course. It goes from the golf course out to the water. It has certain flood areas that the two zone uh, could be considered. So we need to include that in the, in the official plan because you need those policies in place. And the next slide. So this is the technical and other. We have a number of things that we need to do. Uh, councils identified that they want a development approval sunset clause. So we'll need to bring policies in there to there. Uh, basically, it's a draft plan approval extension limitations uh, so that they can't continue on forever and a day. Um, site, uh, some site specific exceptions that have been established um, or removed that aren't applicable anymore. Uh, remove policies, uh, shell versus may and require versus encourage. Um, remove references to septic failure beds um, and consider an alternate policy in relation to that. Create monitoring policies, obviously official plan, you need to monitor the effectiveness of official plan. And we wanted to update that monitoring elements to streamline the annual reporting and data collection requirements. Uh, we have adopted a number of official plan amendments to the official plan that will need to be ruled in. Uh, those approvals need to be recognized. Um, Short-term accommodations and, and uh, what we call cottage rentals will need to update policies in relation to that. We'll need to tweak wording around the creation of right-of-way access at municipal discretion. This whole issue of, of having full and open maintained roads for access where a right-of-way may work in certain locations. So we'll need to update those and apply the applicable appropriate agreements in that regard. And the next slide, just carrying on with the technical and other, um, we need to tweak wording to facilitate land amalgamation for future development purposes. So as development compile lands and interim access is required, we need to update those policies. Uh, revo review those uses requiring site plan approval. Uh, site plan approval, an element where you can deal with the layout of a property in relation to parking, location of buildings. So we need to update those, uh, where those types of developments should be applicable. And also we've heard that um, we probably can do a better job in getting notice out there on major applications. So the Planning Act of Ontario has the minimum requirements. And if we really wanna do more, then those policies should be contained within official plan. And we'll be having some discussion on what those would be uh, applicable for sure. Um, another one that we've heard, um, somebody raised uh, a particular uh, item, other I saw in the correspondence, was the Climate Change Action Plan. Um, we know that the county is just uh, finalizing their Climate Change Action Plan, and our official plan will need to include some of those elements coming forward. So I uh, saw that in one of the correspondence that was read. So that highlights, um, I think that was the last slide, I, I believe. I don't think there was anything. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just how you can uh, get the current copy of the official plan. It is available. So if you want to see what's there now, it's it's on our website. Um, we also have the preliminary scope of issues. Again, it's preliminary. It's not the final list of issues. They, that will continue to be billed as we go through process. Um, if you wanted to be added to mailing list, please email planning at meforditch.ca so that you can be circulated. Or if you don't have email, call into the office and we'll put your mailing address on, on there as well. And all written comments can also be uh, directed to planning at meforditch.ca and they'll be uh, shared with the planning consultant as we move through this review process. So 
That concludes the presentation. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Your Worship, the intent of the day is just to, I guess if you've heard those issues that we're already looking at, that's great. But if there's something we've missed, sure, raise it. We'd love to hear it. You can write in again. Today is not the last day for that. It's sort of the kickoff of this whole consultation process for sure. Thanks for that, Rob. Uh, pretty pretty uh, uh, inclusive for sure, but I'm sure that uh, our presenters, our public who are with us today have some comments to share. In fact, I know there's at least 16 of them. And we've also heard from many of these folks uh, via email and uh, um, uh, correspondence. And all of these comments will be compiled in the staff report and brought forward um, at the appropriate time for further discussion by uh, council. So we certainly, uh, with the ground uh, that uh, uh, Rob has established tonight, um, it is now the public's turn to offer any comments they have or uh, suggestions for what to be included um, in this official uh, review. So uh, each of our speakers has five minutes and because we are running on a tight time frame tonight, I'm going to be uh, sticking to it as close as we can. I encourage you to um, offer your comments. Um, there have been uh, 16 people have registered uh, to speak tonight and we certainly thank them for their participation in the public process. So um, we will begin with Kyle Lamb. Uh, not present, your mayor. Sorry, uh, your honor. Okay. Then we'll go to Hugh and, and uh, Kim Grafton. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be part of this process. Um, I would like to um, say that I realize the pressure that all the development is putting on council and staff to make some pretty major decisions and uh, we do not envy you that task, but we also have some concerns about some of the um, decisions and changes that may be made to the official plan and how they will affect all the citizens of Meaford. Um, I'd like to say that the unprecedented growth in the construction and housing industry has impacted development in our area. And it's known in the industry as the COVID boom and it's putting pressure on small rural communities all across Ontario, not just Meaford, everyone is feeling this. Developers are eager to ride this boom and are putting pressure on municipal councils and staff across Ontario to relax their building restrictions and water down the intent of official plans to accommodate the scale of their large urban proposals geared to increasing their profits. I urge you to not give in to the pressures of developers but to fall back on our OP as it was created to see us safely and resolutely through such times. I would like to, us to uphold the vision we have of our community by upholding our official plan as our means forward. Make informed revisions on density levels, building heights, protect our waterfront, keep it visible and accessible for everyone in the community. We do not want to become another Collingwood where growth has outpaced their ability to provide essential infrastructure. Stand by your OP and hold it up to developers. This is the only policy, policy tool along with smart zoning bylaws that will impart healthy and sustainable growth. And I am asking that all of council think about those issues as they work on our new official plan. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Next on our list is uh, John Armstrong. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm here with an organization called Masonry Works, which is the, the Ontario Masonry Association. And uh, certainly we, uh, we follow municipalities all over the province that are doing official plan reviews and we make recommendations to those municipalities on how they can put language into those plans to ensure that builders build to a higher standard. So that's what I'm here to talk uh, with you uh, uh, about today. Uh, certainly a lot of that is done through urban design guidelines. 
And in many circumstances, urban design guidelines uh, are kept to a later phase versus the OP. They're put into a secondary plan or they're standalone documents. Uh, however, that's not always the case. So it may be something that Meaford wants to consider putting some urban design language right into their OPs. And I'll, and I'll just tell you why, uh, because that you know sometimes uh, we, we, for example, uh, were looking at your former, uh, your, your current plan, and there were a number of references to design guidelines, but we couldn't find, we actually couldn't find some of those guidelines. So they may be there, but we just, we just couldn't find them. But it's not uncommon for municipalities to write in references to urban design guidelines within their, uh, within their OPs, and then not get to doing those urban design guidelines. And so when you don't have those urban design guidelines, you're really at the mercy of a builder who wants to come to town and build substandard and, and build some, some substandard housing. So encouraging and making sure that, that either you allocate uh, budget and proper timing to have for the creation of those design guidelines uh, to, to prevent uh, the, 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 the uh, poor workmanship, poor quality uh, is something that we, that we recommend or potentially incorporating it. Cornwall, for example, and Russell Township up near Ottawa, uh, both have some of that language put right into their uh, put right into their OPs. Uh, also, we, we, we would recommend that you that that where obviously downtowns are really are really important. Um, um, a lot of people's lives and living happens in their own neighborhoods. So putting all of your putting all of your focus on, on the downtown, I think is important. But when you're looking at design guidelines and what kind of a community you want, those neighborhoods are important too. So we certainly encourage you to to do not to, to, to not just take that downtown focus, but really to focus on on uh, uh, on, on the neighborhoods as well. Uh, and then uh, the, the last thing that I'll say as it relates to uh, de design, uh, design guidelines um, is, is to be specific. I, I did note that, in, that you're doing a review of, uh, of, of shoulds and shalls and, and uh, in, in, in some of the language. Certainly the, the, the studies that, that we've seen point to being specific in your language helps everybody. Oftentimes, and there was a qu quite a long phase when, when a lot of municipalities were using very soft language. Soft language actually means that, that the municipality can interpret something one way and then a builder can interpret something another way and the next thing you know, you're into a fight and there's time delays and it's costing money and, it, and, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a problem for everyone. By being specific in your language, uh, then everybody, then, then everybody's expectations are clear, and it allows everybody to, to to respond accordingly, and actually speeds things up and streamlines the process. Uh, so, uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity, and uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll certainly be following along and participating in 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 your discussion. Uh, Meaford is a is a fabulous uh, heritage community with one of those wonderful one of those wonderful uh, masonry brick downtowns, and 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 uh, so we'd like to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, Andrew Payne. Hi, thank you, uh, Your Worship. I'm also here with Masonry Works, but I won't belabor the point um, in, in, in respect to the, the agenda that you have. I just want to reiterate what my colleague uh, John said and kind of point out that uh, Meaford now has an opportunity uh, to kind of set the precedence for growth as pressures from, from the GTA move upwards and pressures from Collingwood move outward to uh, to Meaford. Um, Meaford does have a, a very, uh, a very strong heritage um, asset in its downtown. So making sure that that resiliency, durability, and uh, just kind of overall placemaking that is created by uh, masonry construction is extended out throughout the, uh, throughout the community. I think that would make, uh, you know, make it a lot easier to address development pressures in a way that the community would be more accepting of. So with that, I'll yield back my time uh, to you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your, your comments. Uh, next one is uh, Reed Barrett. Yes, good evening. Thank you for this opportunity, uh, your worship and uh, council. Um, I'm, this is an exciting time when uh, Meaford has the opportunity to open their official plan. Uh, five years is a long time, and we've seen a lot of changes, particularly in the past two. Um, so I'm just thinking that it's um, uh, a lot of change that will happen to uh, this year's plan because 
it, it's way beyond uh, tweaking and, and uh, just minor revisions. Um, I'm also excited the fact that there's going to be a public consultation and uh, we'll take into account all the uh, reports uh, that have been done in the last uh, five years. Um, I think we should think about uh, adding the opportunity at the same time of these public consultations to consider a little broader document, perhaps a community vision that would take into some of the things we heard about design specifications. Uh, we could um, also have some themes in there like uh, attracting and retaining businesses to the uh, downtown, uh, revitalization of the downtown, um, but a lot of things that might fall out of uh, outside of a technical document really into uh, what we want Meaford to be and the overall vision of it. Uh, I would suggest that a community vision uh, could have um, uh, report backs on a more frequent basis than a five-year uh, official plan. Uh, we could do it semi-annually with um, uh, an execution uh, plan. And I think there's even provincial money through the modernization fund to fund something like this. So I thank you for the opportunity, but I'd like us to think a little bit broader and wider than just the official plan into uh, an overall community vision for uh, Meaford. Thank you. Thank you, Reed. Uh, the next one we have is Rick Riordan. Thank you, Your Worship and members of council. Uh, my name is Rick Riordan and my wife and I have lived in Meaford since 2019. And thank you, Rob, for your introductory overview. The a slide about municipal plans and initiatives was helpful to clarify the official plan will in fact uh, reflect the various studies, plans, initiatives already completed and in progress. Specifically, I draw attention to the Economic Development Strategic Plan from 2020. This outlines from this study, uh, the outlines from this study are extremely relevant to the OP re review given the interconnection between vision, economic strategy, and the future land use and development. I'd like to speak to the subject of community identity. Um, studies have identified that Meaford needs to um, determine what it wants to be. And this is curious because Meaford's un unique identity is clearly defined in our community vision outlined in the current official plan under section 1A. We also have a vision statement, the place to be on Southern Georgian Bay. I'm not sure people know what this means and what it looks like, and even if it's true to people's experience. And this may contribute to the confusion surrounding what Meaford wants to be. Perhaps the identity crisis is less about having a clear vision and more about how values and priorities in the current official plan are being interpreted, referenced, and respected. I would put forth that the intent of part A section A1, the community vision remain intact, but supported with detailed articulation to improve accountability to its authority. Concerns over what our community will look like in five years are also based on the fact that Meaford is without an official architectural plan and guidelines for the community. In light of this, I would propose that qualified professionals in architectural design be consulted to provide greater definition to what is meant by 19th century character in the OP. We'd also propose that the official plan review include new standards for public notice signage. I mentioned this in a previous deputation and we'll continue to raise the issue. If indeed better communication with the public is a priority for our council, we need new policies and standards for scale appropriate signage required of developers an adequate radius of written notification for public meeting to be put into effect immediately. According to point seven in Rob's presentation, the downtown core transitional area B1.4.1 found under land use designations in the OP will be a subject of focus. Currently the objectives are defined as to reinforce the importance of the downtown core commercial area by identifying a complementary area for transitional commercial growth 
and development related to the downtown. To protect the residential character of the area adjacent to the downtown, to establish a definitive boundary for the downtown core transitional area within which small scale commercial uses, uses will be permitted. And to ensure that all new development in the downtown core transitional area contributes to the character and identity of the downtown. I would propose that these objectives remain relevant and in alignment with the executive summary of the economic development strategic plan pertaining to Meaford's quote unquote fortunate location noted as quote unquote I ideal location to capture the abundance of opportunity that the region offers found on page seven under the section titled building bridges a plan to economic sustainability according to the international union um, for the scientific study of population the coronavirus has caused a reverse migration from cities to less populated places in rural areas Cases closely linked to high density living are causing people to rethink their residential choices. Demographics are shifting to Meaford too. Situational analysis, including population growth rates, demographic profiles, employment stats that predate this past year will need to be reassessed in light of this change and its impact on our economy, environments, housing needs and development. This puts new priorities in place. I'd like to submit that in tandem with the official plan, a motion be considered to initiate a community vision plan, like many thriving communities in Ontario already provide. I understand that provincial modernization funds are available for this initiative. I believe this is timely and would be an excellent opportunity to pull together all of the collective data from the various task groups to provide a measurable action plan as an outcome. A community vision could also help to streamline the decision process by definition and eliminate the need for repeated decision redundancies on each development application. Volunteers from uh, residents across the town are standing by waiting to assist in this. Uh, as well, myself and the volunteers of Imagine Meaford offer their time for public engagement through kitchen table planning workbooks, surveys, and series of public focus groups, workshops on key issues with the planning consultant uh, contracted to uh, lead me for official plan review. Glad to hear someone's been selected for that. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Spot on time, I appreciate that. Um, next one is Vivian Grant. There you go. Thank you, Mayor Klumpis, councillors, and all the other staff for giving us the time and to voice our opinions for the future development of Meaford. My name is Vivian Grant, and on behalf of my husband and my family and myself, I'm presenting this to express my concerns, our concerns about the imminent rapid growth of Meaford and the need to manage this growth with careful consideration in the hopes to maintain a beautiful small town feel with a huge emphasis on the character and beauty of our, of our waterfront. Not many towns have the waterfront that Meaford has and it should be kept as a jewel of our town. I also strong, I feel strongly that any building should reflect the look of our small town and not a large city. The higher we go up, the more we block views and remain and remove the sunlight. And this may sound ludicrous in this setting that we are in in Meaford today, but once we begin to allow taller buildings with denser population, it'll be too late to go back and change the rulings. I urge everyone involved to really think long and hard of the vision that we want for our town, not our city, and to fight to, fight to maintain character, water views, sunlight, charm, and ease of traffic flow. Um, I, have, I, I, I raised my family in Burlington, Ontario, and having left the city of Burlington as a result of its overpopulation and extensive growth, I'm not interested in watching the same thing happen to Meaford. However, I will say that the waterfront in Burlington was a main concern and that there were extremely strict rules about the visibility of the water and any obstruction of these views. All development was forced to allow for visibility and certain percentages of the waterfront so as not to obstruct the natural beauty and maintain the integrity of the core values of the beauty of the city. Sadly, traffic flow was not planned for and it became a massive issue for residents and those passing through. All things must be considered carefully, including the domino effect that any decision made may have on the future needs and issues and that's why I think it's so important that we have these subcommittees that was just that were just discussed a minute ago because we all have concerns 
And what happens here on one side of town is not necessarily reflected or even a, people aren't even aware of what's happening on another side of town. So we need to have some cohesiveness. There's so much to consider when planning a bigger picture and I sincerely hope that we don't jump at the chance for growth and throw away the opportunity to maintain the feel of the small town that we all love as Meaford. I propose that there needs to be a long-term cited plans with clear guidelines and once approved that we do not find ways to whittle around these guidelines. Vision and planning first, building after and no regrets, please. This means all things must be taken into consideration, including the look, the feel, the hard facts that are associated with growth, such as the infrastructure and whether or not it can support the growth. Let's make sure the existing Meaford is the best it can be before we jump ahead also to plan this new Meaford. The voices and concerns of the people of Meaford must be heard, cohesive plans for all future development and how they will impact each other, as well as the infrastructure of the town in many decades from now, not just the short term, must be considered. It's crucial to the successful future for a lovely gem of a town that we all love. Thank you very much for allowing us to have our voice. Thank you very much for your comments, appreciate it. Uh, next we have Silva Youssef. There you go. Your Worship, members of the Council, good evening. My name is Silva Youssef, Manager of Planning and Development with Park Ridge Lifestyle Communities. I'm here tonight to take this opportunity and ask to be included in the comprehensive OPA review. As per submitted letter by our planner on file, Andrew Pescuzo of Pescuzo Planning. Uh, the letter was sent on May 14th. Parkridge have submitted a development application end of last year, 2020, to the County of Gray Municipality of Meaford, proposing a resource-based uh, recreational development. And we are asking, uh, we would like to take this opportunity and ask the municipality to consider uh, uh, designating our lands from rural to resource recreational. Um, just some contest. I mean, I'm sure uh, we've been in meetings with uh, all of you uh, regarding this uh, land, but just to everyone else, it's uh, the lands, the subject lands are 400 uh, acres between Christie Beach Road, Highway 26, and the county forest. Um, and thanks for the opportunity tonight. And that's it. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, next we have uh, Susan Johnson. Well, thank you, Mayor Clumpus, members of council and staff for being stewards of our wonderful municipality. I do love it here as our motto exclaims, due to your hard work and dedication. Thankfully, we have an official plan that has been honored by your government, a document that enshrines our community vision for the future. While the official plan is under review, Let's continue on the road to create good growth that is managed wisely. This is the opportunity to ask questions that will direct and inform any revisions. This is the opportunity to build a community vision as, success, as suggested by the previous uh, respondents. How we continue to maintain the level of density that is appropriate and sustainable for our community what will the result of increased density be with respect to the well-being of residents? What will the resulting costs of increased density and therefore increased population be to our limited resources? Research shows that increased residential development is more of a tax burden for a community, especially when there is little commercial or industrial sources of tax revenue to help offset costs. Based on information posted on the Meaford website, there are over 1,000 additional residential units in works at this time. The residents of Meaford, both urban and rural, need to be leery about the magnitude of this growth. Otherwise, they can expect a drain on municipal resources and resulting significant property tax increases. How will we preserve the qualities of Meaford that are inherent in this small Ontario town, such as low rise buildings, 
that are integrated into the townscape? What will we lose by allowing building heights to increase? Also, will we continue to protect our Georgian Bay waterfront, the shining jewel of Meaford, both environmentally and visually? Will we allow our waterfront to be obstructed by a wall of buildings? Or will we allow it to breathe with open space adjacent to the new development? Let's not bury this precious resource that is a main attraction. Instead, let us keep it visually open and accessible for all to enjoy. We have the opportunity yet now to make the choice to continue to grow wisely. There are some aspects of the official plan, such as an increasing density, increasing building heights and obstruction of the waterfront that will endanger all that is essential for this community that we love. I respectfully ask the council consider the negative ramifications of such changes. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, Susan, for your comments. Next, we have Paul Young. Right. Hello. Um, thank you, Mayor Columbus and Council. Welcome. For listening to uh, my input. Um, having been in part of my career on your side of the microphone, I understand how, uh, how complex and how daunting some of these uh, conversations can be. And I appreciate the hard work that everyone's putting into it, particularly Rob. Anyway, um, I'm going to come across a little bit like Perry Mason here, and if that reference makes any sense to the people on the call. And I'm gonna speak specifically to some of the technical sides of the uh, OP upgrade. Um, in particular, uh, bringing the official plan into conformity with the Gray County plan. Um, I think missing from the more specifically list in the section of bringing, bringing things into compliance, um, there's any reference to section 7.13 of the Gray County OP uh, entitled climate change. Uh, quoting from that section, uh, climate change is considered by many to be the world's biggest challenge in the coming century. We must take action to adopt, adapt, I should say, adapt to and mitigate the effects of a changing climate. This will include making greater efforts and I refer to Rob's comment about some of these things are restrictive, but we can do more than what, what, what the Gray County OP re re requires. Anyway, um, greater efforts to protect and enhance the re resiliency of our natural built and social environments. The Gray County plan has been written with this object objective in mind. The following are principles and policies to assist with mitigating and adapting to the impacts of climate change. And they bring up two points in the Gray County plan. Green technologies and construction methods, and they use the words will be used, not may be used. They use the words will be used whenever possible and feasible for new construction and the replacement of civic in infrastructure, which is civic buildings. And point nine in that plan is promote retrofits for energy efficiency in built heritage structures while maintaining their cultural integrity. And I recognize the council looks after a lot of these cultural uh, buildings. So I have a simple request. I'm, I'm winding up now. Um, I'm res respectfully requesting that the coming OP from Meaford includes specific text sections relating to climate change mitigation and reductions per the direction of the Gray County OP. I'm asking that these text sections regarding new construction, renovations and retrofits, make use of the shell word, not the may word, and that they make use of the require word, not the encourage word, wherever the legal authority levels of the Meaford OP and the bylaws permit such rulemaking and the requirements are technically feasible. I'm well aware that I'm asking for what may seem like a big change from business as usual, 
regarding construction permits, approvals, and the costs of new buildings and renovations. But everyone is telling us, and particularly climate experts, and I believe them, that if we do not start working on together, together on this now, not in five years, not in 10 years when there's a new OP, by making changes to the way that new homes, condos and renovations and retrofits are using fossil fuels and electricity and in insulation materials, it will be too late for our descendants. A Meaford with no snow for winter sports and a Meaford that is too hot to grow apples in the summer is not a future I want to be responsible for. So I've included, uh, and I'm just gonna make a brief reference to it. I've included in my written submission, an appendix on how this can be done. There's many, many communities in Ontario, the size of Meaford that are already tackling this problem successfully using federal funds. There's $1.8 billion of federal funds available specifically for municipalities of our size to tackle these problems. $900 million of projects to tackle this issue have already been approved. This has launched 1,300 municipal projects that are green. Right? It's, it's providing 11,000 incremental jobs. And I've included in my submission, my written submission, links to various websites, particularly the Federation of Canadian Mun Municipalities, who have a, a, an amazing effort on uh, um, green development standards. They have toolkits, which Rob and the various members of staff are welcome to use. And these toolkits can be, can be used um, immediately, as in the town of Whis Whitby or the city of Vaughan or the town of Caledon, which are already using them. These, these toolkits can be used to implement changes to bylaws and put specific text into the OP. And I thank you very much for listening to me. And thank you very much for your comments, Paul. Appreciate your coming. Yeah. Uh, next, we have Alan Reed. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Klumpus and council and, and my fellow citizens. Um, my interest in the OP is uh, about preserving the Meaford we have and love. Um, I don't have a lot to add to comments already made by Rick, Vivian, Kim, Hugh, Susan, and the last gentleman, um, Paul. Um, my concern with the OP is it. I was encouraged by Rob's overview um, and the fact that some of the items that I think are, uh, for lack of better words, that are broken now, uh, the notification process for planning, et cetera, are to be addressed. If, and I, and I will engage through the process that's been outlined and uh, hope to make a contribution. If I had a question at this point in time, given uh, we've paid a lot of attention to the height of buildings, which is uh, an important thing as uh, reiterated by the other members of the citizenry that I, I referenced, um, will the changes to the OP prevent some of these uh, quote unquote developments in time? Uh, the one that's coming up at 6.30, the Sky Development, which I call Sky Devolution. Uh, the people care, these people who want six stories. A question, if I can ask it, and, and I would respect an answer, um, will those changes come soon enough? In other words, will the citizenry have a chance to speak and express in the OP that six stories or five stories or the bonus system, whatever vehicle is being used, will be put in place soon enough to prevent these buildings from Messing up our town. I don't know, Barb Clumpus, whether you can answer that or not, or maybe Rob is still there, but will those changes come fast enough to prevent those developments that I see as a, a pox in our fair town? Um, we have, uh, Rob is still here with us, Alan, and uh, he has appeared on the screen, so we'll ask him to uh, respond. Yeah, um, as, as far as I am aware, um, obviously, every time you get into issues, there's the whole legal question <laughs> that always comes to play. But as far as I'm aware, an application, when being considered, must be considered in relation to the policies applicable at the time. 
Um, so I guess the official plan policies uh, that are in place now will be those policies that, that the current developments need to or must be or have to be reviewed uh, against and considered. So, so which means if I if I'm okay, I'm off mute. Which means that if we the citizens don't want these five and six story properties to be developed, we need to organize and lobby and picket and write petitions and raise hell to make sure that they don't go ahead. Is that kind of a fair summary? Because the current policies are in place and will be in place until the new plan is blessed in 2022. Am I right on there, Rob? Yeah, you're through the worship. So um, the current official plan allows three stories as of right. Anything more than that is a special consideration. So I think the intent is that you would need to speak to those special considerations and why a particular development does not meet those special considerations under the current official plan policies. Okay, all right. Th I, I appreciate your political skill. <laughs> and I mean that as a compliment, I do. Um, but kind of, you know, to the council, you'll be hearing from myself and others because this is just not right, what they're trying to do. Um, some of the written submissions are very pointed and point out the problem with the density that's proposed at Sky, with the issues that people care were trying to get by us last year. So I don't, I'm not, I don't want to be rude or disrespectful, but uh, hold on because it's going to be a, an email full of, of, it's going to be a summer full of emails to try and get this turned around and stopped. That's all. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Alan. Uh, next on our list is Alex Hector. Thank you, uh, Mayor, excuse me, Mayor Clumpus and Council. Really appreciate the opportunity. And uh, I, I uh, echo um, um, almost all of the comments that um, um, my fellow Mefordites have, uh, have spoken tonight. So I, I won't rehash that. Just two things uh, very quickly. One, I just want to compliment Rob for uh, um, his comment to exceed the minimum requirements. And, and I think that's what really uh, makes Meaford special is people wanting to go the extra way to to um, preserve our, our beautiful little community here. And uh, so I was delighted to hear that, Rob. Thank you very much. Just a, uh, a suggestion in terms of dealing with that challenge of uh, managed growth and against sustaining um, uh, community charm. Um, Two communities seem to do a pretty good job at that, and that's Niagara on the Lake and Perth. And I just wonder if if there isn't some uh, a potential advantage to be gained by studying their OPs uh, to see how they've been able to achieve that balance between growth and maintaining the uh, the sort of the cultural aspects of the community. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Alex. And uh, next we have Karen Coleman. Hi. Um, uh, Mayor and uh, council members, I appreciate this chance to, um, to present my ideas and my feelings. Um, my main concern is about um, managing for climate change and, uh, in the context of growth. And I, I don't think, I, you know, I, I've heard wonderful ideas from everybody and I hear your passion and I'm really inspired to, uh, inspired by you. But um, my husband and I moved here two years ago uh, because, of, because of Meaford's charm and peace and then COVID happened and everything has changed. And I think the everything has changed peace means that we can, uh, approach, for example, um, Gray's OP and say, well, no, things are different now. We have to, we have to, we have to do this now. We uh, and I, I read that we can do that formally in, in making an amendment. So um, if that's true, then we should do that. And, and so my point's more about um, climate, the climate crisis and new development I feel really strongly that we need to understand that um, driving electric cars and uh, uh, um, retrofitting a building and 
improving insulation and all that, but still using natural gas because we've got union utility running through town very conveniently is, is not enough. We have to, we have to, we have to get off of natural gas. And I think our opportunity um, to show leadership in that regard is um, by um, mandating may not be the right word, but you know, insisting that, that any new developers come have to show us how they're going to do that. And if they can't do that because it's too expensive or it's not what they already do, why not, um, why not through the economic development plan or wherever, or through another committee or wherever it, it, it fits, um, put a call out to attract green, green developers who are already doing this. And I just think that such gives me such hope to think that Meaford could actually set an example as a community that is, um, you know, setting an example. Um, 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 and we should also also be careful when we when we consider this not to be scared off by the rhetoric that um, that we can read from the uh, fossil fuel industry that you know we won't be able to do it and um, you know all that all that stuff they're fostering fear um, and marketing that the way that the cigarette industry told us that or hid that we couldn't get cancer and smoking was okay. So um, we have to plan and manage for the climate crisis now because what we do now is, you know, um, it's, it's, it's for, for now for forever. It's cheaper to do it now than to do something else and say, oh, well, you know, we should have done it this way, let's change it and anyway, it'll be, too late for our future generations. We, we just need to really, really focus on this. And so um, I think I've been adamant enough and you get my point and I'll just be repeating myself, I think if I continue. So thank you very much. Thank you, Karen, I appreciate you coming. Next okay. we have Vince Rogers. Inside of your time, yeah. very good. See, you had a minute and ten left. Right? Very good. And we good? <laughs> You're on voice. <laughs> okay. 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 Hopefully, I'm not number sixteen, and I'll try to keep everybody uh, awake. Uh, Your Worship, Madam Deputy Mayor, Councillors, thank you for this opportunity for me to be heard on the issue of the official plan. I'm going to be probably echoing a lot of what you've already heard already, but if you may indulge me for a moment or two. Uh, about 20 years ago, I was the general manager of a logistics company. At a senior management meeting, uh, ownership wanted to increase the margins on the transactions that were being booked. So we agreed to incentivize our dispatchers by bonusing them if they averaged a, a profit of a certain percentage. We all agreed that this made a lot of sense. However, it wasn't until we drilled down on the results the following quarter, we, we found an issue. Yes, margins were up. However, profits were down. As it turned out, because we bonus based on getting over a certain percentage, some employees were not booking profitable loads with lower percentages as it affected their bonus. We missed looking at the solution from every angle. There was three le lessons that came out of that. One, although we had good intentions, we looked at the solution too simply. We weren't specific enough about the measurable goal and the logical steps to get there. Two, we didn't understand the law of unintended consequences, how it affected the business and the employees, both in the short term and the long term. And three, we didn't get outside input. We stayed in our circle of influence. If we had just discussed with this with some experienced business mentors, they could have helped us see what was coming. Okay, so why do I, why do I tell you this non-complimentary story? Because I was the guy leading it. Because I see similarities between this and the execution of the official plan. When the official plan says, and I quote, and I know you guys know this, according to the residents of Meaford, the excellent quality of life is what makes the municipality a desirable place to live. This quality of life is created in large part by the distinct 19th century character of the urban area with its downtown and established neighborhoods and the municipality's rural area 
but that small settlement areas, farmland, country homes, open scenic countryside, extensive woodland areas, and shoreline communities. These are the qualities that taken together contribute to the identity of the community that is of the greatest importance of the residents. And, but <laughs> when we talk about development, it gets thrown out there. I, I appreciate all that, but, but we need attainable housing. Um, which, which nobody degree, uh, disagrees with that we need. Um, I, you know, I asked for a clear definition of what attainable means and 10 different people can have 10 different answers. Then I ask, well, well how much do we need? And, and, and I get answers like a lot or, or quite a bit, but I've never really heard a clear number or a percentage. I, I can't even ask the next, next logical question, which is how did you get to that number? When I ask if it's sustainable beyond the first home buyer, the answer is usually uh, no. It appears the word attainable is political speak, which is a shame because people need to have an entry point into the housing market here in Meatford. When we speak about density, we hear 20 units per hectare, but it doesn't really seem overly clear. Is that a starting point? Is that an average or, or how we got that number? Or, or even if that's the right number for Meaford? When we talk about architectural heritage, what, are, what specifically are we looking for and what are our minimum requirements? Not only is it not fair to the residents as we can end up with something that nobody wants, it's not fair to the developers. They need to know upfront what the expectations are. And let's be clear, we do need development but we, ne we need well thought out development. And let's be clear about something else. It's not the city, it's, which is a term I find reprehensible, um, which is bad for Meaford. What's going to be bad for Meaford is a lack of articulated, defined vision. And as a caveat, this is not a reflection on the staff of the municipality. My experience with Mr. Armstrong and his staff have been nothing but positive. They are, they are excellent but they can only work with the tools at their disposal. So in closing, and take it from somebody who's made these mistakes. One, we need a clearly articulated vision for where and how we want to grow with wording that is non-ambiguous and binding that clearly tells developers, hey, we, we're open for business, but if you wanna do business here, this is what you need to do. My understanding is this can be accomplished through a comprehensive community vision plan. And two, these issues are complicated and I have sympathy for council navigating through this. It's been written in the paper that the tsunami of growth is here, but what also is here is a tsunami of people who have a wide swath of life experiences that can contribute, want to contribute, want to be heard and want to be part of the positive change coming to Meaford. Don't make collaboration as the new leadership a bumper sticker, make it a cornerstone of how we govern. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Vince. And we move on now to Catherine Haggard. Thank you. Good evening, Your Worship and Council. Uh, my name is Catherine Haggard and I own a home in the town of Meaford. I would like to seek some clarification uh, from the planning department, if Rob Armstrong's still there, on uh, architectural control on new developments. Now, I think this was spoken to by John Armstrong. It was mentioned by Andrew Payne earlier, and I'm the third person to raise it. Um, I understand that design guidelines have been discussed by Meaford Planning, but I'm not clear where the municipality is at in that process, by what mechanism it's being done, or if the public input is being sought. Design guidelines for Meaford would help ensure that the strategic goals in Meaford's official plan, that all future developments have a high standard of urban design and a high degree of aesthetic quality are actually being met. Given the increased volume of development applications, there is some urgency to having design guidelines in place and soon. So if someone from planning is there that could speak to this to clarify the process and perhaps provide a timeline when design guidelines would be operative, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine and Rob. You're still with us. Do you want to yep. respond Very to Very quickly, your worship. Um, so we do have design guidelines as part of the community improvement plan area mm -hmm. and the Heritage Conservation District downtown. They were developed some time ago, probably need updating, but will be considered as part of that update. 
We've also um, applied for the modernization funding to include updates to our engineering standards and create urban design guidelines. So we're hoping to proceed with that process uh, very shortly upon receiving that funding. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And our last speaker on this topic is Diane Hilliard. Perfect, because mine's more of a motherhood statement, so you'll all love this. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship, uh, Deputy Mayor Keevney, Councillors, and esteemed municipal staff for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Diane Hilliard, and yes, I love it here too. As a resident, I'm happy to be a part of the official plan review process. So first and foremost, thank you. I recognize this as an important policy document, and I believe in its ultimate power in shaping a community, our community. I find that the timing for this review is crucial right now. With mass developments in the pipeline, we must pay detailed attention to this important document and work to tighten the language to protect our natural environment and the character of developed and undeveloped areas of our municipality. We must expand on the definitions that are somewhat vague and have been left open to interpretation because with accuracy and intent, they will better guide the process and ultimately have a positive direct impact on the outcome. I look forward to getting into the weeds on the OP and working with my neighbors and staff on this important project. And I hope each of you, Mayor Clumpus, Council and staff will welcome those who come to the table with good ideas and a great passion for our Meaford. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. And thank you to all of our presenters for your very thoughtful, respectful comments. We, we really value this uh, community interchange and uh, look forward to these opportunities to do so. So uh, Diane, your point though at the end was well taken, we certainly welcome. Uh, our uh, residents to join us in uh, plotting our path forward. So thank you all for that. And I will now turn it over to council. If uh, any of our councillors have uh, a comment, any um, issue that you would like to raise as part of this review. Yes, Deputy Mayor. Your Worship, thank you very much. And I would like to just reiterate your comments of how absolutely wonderful and exciting it is to hear from so many people tonight and to hear their passions and, and their um, intent to be part of this process. And, and I, if I could do a quick word cloud, so to speak, the words that, that I have heard and have written down, uh, climate and, and community vision and public engagement and be mindful of our waterfront and specific language as we move forward in the planning process, there are uh, a number of uh, similarities we have heard here in the comments tonight, which is really helpful to council as we move into this process. So my sincere thanks to everyone who has participated here this evening. Thank you, Shirley. Um, Rob? Yes, Your Worship. Um, I wanted to mention that um, we did receive some correspondence for someone who unfortunately didn't get the link and, and did want to speak. Um, I have been in communication with Stefan Tremblay. We do have his written information. And as I've said, this is a long process. Uh, the written word is just as good as the verbal word. And sometimes the written word is even <laughs> better because we have it in documented uh, in written format. So um, they will be considered just as much as, as all the verbal presentations tonight and will be engaged sure. in that process going forward. So. Thank you for bringing that forward again, because uh, I'm sure we'll, we will hear uh, from folks continuously, and that's a good mm -hmm. thing. We certainly want uh, as many as wish to participate in this process. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Councillor Bell. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you to everyone that took time tonight to uh, make a comment on this. I think for me, it, uh, it's always been about a comment that was brought forward earlier, good growth managed properly. And I think that, I think if we put our heads around that, I think we will have the vision and we will have the municipality that we all want to enjoy. So thank you to each one who participated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anything further from council? I'm not seeing anything. 
Right. As I've mentioned, we do look forward to working with everyone on the review of the official plan. And uh, I just want to reiterate again that it is important to note that this is a plan for the community. And so we welcome uh, with open arms the uh, participation and involvement from all of those who wish to uh, join us in this plan. So I just wanted to comment that if anyone else wishes to uh, be added to the mailing list to receive for, uh, future notices of uh, these opportunities, please contact the planning staff at planning at meford.ca with your information and uh, written comments, of course, can be directed to the planning staff and they too uh, will be considered by staff consultants in the council through the official plan review process. So um, we will uh, adjourn this meeting at this point and uh, we will be holding, of course, our second, uh, uh, our second planning meeting this evening at uh, 6.30. So that's coming up very quickly. At this time, I declare this particular meeting adjourned. Thanks for your participation, everyone. We'll have a five minutes or six minute stretch. Hi there, this is the um, host of the meeting. I'm just trying to figure out who I've got calling in right now on the phone. I've unmuted you. If you could just uh, unmute yourself and let me know who it is. Okay, I'll come back to you. I've got a couple other things I'd like to figure out here. Now, currently I have two Susan Taylors in my list. <laughs> so I'm wondering if I can figure that out. Hello. Hello. Oh, who's on the Hi, phone? This is Kim Grafton. And um, we were in the Zoom meeting and we lost it, um, something glitching here. So we phoned in to try and catch the end of the meeting. And we obviously very much want to be a part of the next meeting. Are you registered? Um, no, sure what we can do. Um, my computer is saying that the Zoom is not... Um, I, I'm um, sorry, I can't fix your Zoom for you right now. Um, but sorry, can you just tell me your name one more time? It's Kim and Hugh Grafton. Okay, yes, I've got you there. I would just recommend trying to restart your computer. The next meeting hasn't started yet. Uh, that would be the best thing you could do. Thank you. Okay, so... Next. Oh, hello. Is this Susan Taylor who's unmuted? This is Susan Taylor. Awesome. Okay, that's great. So now I have somebody else I'm going to try and figure out who it is. Thank you, Susan. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> hmm. So I'm going to mute this one. Okay, there'll be one panelist, or sorry, one attendee out there right now who should be able to see their microphone, who is permitted to speak. And this is the one who I, I have mislabeled, I believe, as Susan Taylor. So if you see a microphone and you have the ability to unmute, I'm actually going to request that you unmute right now. If you could maybe just let me know who you might be. Oh, no. Now I've got another one. Now I have a, oh, okay, hold on. Hmm. Okay, we'll move on to the next for now. I'll leave you unmuted. And just so you're aware on the, um, on the telephone, um, Hugh and Kim Grafton, I will let you, um, if you can't be connected via your internet or via your video signal, I will still let you speak uh, when it is your turn in the list uh, through the telephone. So if you want to just stay connected that way, that's not a problem. Okay, now I'm going to just go down here. Now, here's another one. Um, Can I ask you a question? Yes, go ahead. 
We are trying to reboot our computer here. We're not having a lot of luck. But okay. will I be able to hear what is being said on the telephone? Yes, you will, because I'm in the meeting right now. We're on the meeting. We're in the meeting right now. So you'll be able to hear everything that's going on. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I've got um, Judy Ward listed here. Uh, Judy, are you there? I felt, um... Judy Ward. Yes, I'm here. So I, I don't have you on my list. Oh, my husband registered. He's on another computer. We're in two different places. Oh, okay. So Barry is here to speak, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Muir, I don't see you on my list and I just want to double check that I've got the name right. Yeah, it's Chris Pigeon and we have a Zoom account, but it's registered to Kevin Muir. Oh, it's Muir. Chris. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very if much. If you could rename me to I Chris will. Pigeon. Yeah, I will. I will. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Mayor hmm. Clumpus, it's Margaret. And I just wanted to ask if we could have a minute or two more. We do have quite a number of participants, as you know. So Derek's just working through getting everybody named so it can go smoothly. Thank you, Margaret. I was just going to ask that same question if you need more time. I think we're almost there. Derek's done All a right. fantastic job. We have, I believe, 80, uh, th sorry, 38 people registered. So we're just almost at the point of being ready. Sorry for the delay. Um, Bruce Robertson. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, Hi there. Sorry. This is Bruce Robertson? Yes, it is. Oh, I don't have you on my list. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I, I, I clicked through, with the, through, yeah, through the link. Sorry, are, are you just uh, something wanting to speak or? Yes, yes. I'm just, did you register? Yes, I did. Okay, I'll let Margaret talk to me about that one and I will go back to someone else. Thank you. Hold on one second. I have Bruce Robertson. Thank you. I maybe I've missed it. Sorry, what's the number there, Mayor Clumpus? I'm 19. Reading, I'm reading too fast. There he is. Sorry about that. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I think at this point I'm close enough that uh, you could get going and uh, I can get the rest sorted out on my own there, uh, Mayor Clumpus. If you need uh, time, just let us know. 
Okay, thank you. But it is the appointed hour, and so we will begin to resume this council meeting and uh, this public information, um, so public meeting. Um, I do have a little bit of a preamble to go through uh, from the with regards to the Planning Act. So I will welcome everyone participating, all of our council is here and our staff um, and our participants. As uh, we have noted, there are 38 uh, people who wish to comment on this planning matter and we're delighted to have you join us here today. So we are uh, here uh, to hear about a proposal to amend the land use planning permissions and to develop a vacant land plan, land plan of condominium applying to certain lands in the municipality of Meaford. It's very important for me to note that the Planning Act requires that a person who may later wish to file an appeal to council's decision on the zoning bylaw amendment application must either provide verbal comments today at this public meeting or provide written comments to council before the amendments are passed. The intention of this requirement is that only those who have taken the time and the care to learn about the proposal and to engage in the planning process may have an opportunity to appeal a decision to the local planning appeal tribunal. While council is legally required to make decisions that conform to the county and the local official plans, our guiding policies encourage us to reach out to you, members of this community, to hear your thoughts about the proposed changes. We have a variety of legal tools available to us that we can apply to development to help us ensure that new uses can coexist with existing uses with as minimal an impact as possible. Your constructive comments will help us to learn more about your neighborhood, which in turn will help staff and council to select the right tools to manage change effectively and in a manner that honors our community values and priorities. Those who have pre-registered for today's meetings will have an opportunity to speak. You do not have to be solely in support or opposition. It's okay to share your thoughts about those elements that you do or that you don't like about the proposal and to ask questions as well. While the applicant will have an opportunity to respond to questions and comments, at the end of the meeting, in some cases, we may need to have staff carry out research on the matters raised and to provide answers or additional information to you following the meeting. So I will now call this particular um, part of the public meeting to order. It is a joint public meeting of the County of Gray and the Council of the Municipality of Meaford to consider a proposed draft plan of condominium and zoning bylaw amendment for 226 Boucher Street East and adjacent parcels to the Northwest along Fuller Street in the urban area of Meaford. In addition, a related request is also being considered regarding the proposed exchange and sale of 647.5 square meters of municipally owned land for amalgamation with the development lands. The property requested is the extension of the Bridge Street Road Allowance on the east side of Fuller Street. It is important for me to note that the Municipality of Meaford Council is the approval authority for the zoning bylaw amendment and land sale proposals being discussed today. And the County of Grey Council is the approval authority for the plan of condominium proposal. However, both municipal and county staff and councils work collaboratively together on these applications. This meeting is a mandatory part of the planning process, which has been set out by the Planning Act. Based on the rules in the Act, there must be at least 20 days notice given to residents within 120 meters of the property. And I note that uh, notice was issued on April the 14th, 2021, and notice of the plan of condominium was issued on April the 26th, 2021, giving more than the 20 days notice. So let's get started. First, I will ask the CAO and Director of Development Services, Rob Armstrong, to share a brief description of the application and to provide us with any public and agency comments that have been received to date. Rob? Your Worship, um, the Deputy Mayor has a, a question or comment. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Rob. And at this time, I wish to declare a conflict of interest in this particular uh, project on the basis that I have an ownership interest in a portion of the parcel of land under consideration. 
Okay, thank you for that, uh, Deputy Mayor, and you will mute your your uh, video and your phone. Thank you. Uh, your, thank you. Thank you for picking that up, um, Rob, and yep. off you go. Thank you, Worship. Um, so with regard to description of the application, I won't get into too much details on the zoning uh, request because that will be covered off by uh, the applicants in their agent's presentation. Uh, they'll be explaining the planning processes. I will speak that in accordance with, there's another element to this public meeting, and that is that in accordance with the sale of property bylaw of the municipality of Meaford, um, when there's consideration being given to the sale of land or uh, in this case, as a request an exchange of land, we are required to also give public notice and receive public input with regard to that component. So as you had mentioned in the notice, there's a request uh, to purchase um, a portion of land uh, at the end of Bridge Street. And it's, it's shown on the map that we own as an extension uh, that really has no municipal requirements at this time. And in lieu of it, they uh, wish to sell us um, the land that is in the south uh, east corner of the property uh, and uh, in relation to uh, the water course that runs through. Obviously, as part of that consideration, uh, there'll be an assessment of value uh, for and value against on the two parcels as part of that consideration, which will be done prior to any consideration of disposal of those lands. But the intent is to obtain any public input with regard to those. Uh, for the purposes of this evening, we have received a number of comments. Um, from an agency perspective, we have received comments from the uh, historic Saugeen, Métis, Enbridge Gas, Canada Post and Bell Canada, as well as we've received comments from the Grace Auble Conservation Authority. And I'll just read their recommendations for, for the record and for council and for the public. Grace Auble Conservation Authority generally has no objections to the above noted application at this time. We recommend the following draft plan conditions for your consideration. A stormwater management plan be prepared and implemented through an agreement, satisfaction to the Grace Auble taken into consideration uh, comments within the letter, a vegetation management and tree protection plan to be prepared and implemented. And then uh, just a note that some of the lands fall with Ontario regulation and permits required. So it's their standard comments that come forward with any development uh, proposal. With regard to public comments, we um, what I intend to do, obviously I won't go through all of them. They are part of the record. We do have them on file. I'm going to read um, all the names of those that we do have the comments so that uh, they can be noted. Um, and I will at the end summarize just some of the key elements to those. Obviously there's a lot more detail in the letters and, uh, and all those details will be considered as part of the, uh, the review process, but uh, I, I will do that now. So um, I think it's an alphabetical. So it's, uh, we'll go through it. Michael Anderson, Reed and Petra Barrett, Lori Bell and Body. Louise Bucella, Claire Kane, Cairns, Phil Kant, Christine Codrington, Christine Coleman, Karen Coleman, Bill Courage, Linda Cunningham, Evelyn Dean, Jane Douglas, Donna Earl, John Earl, Mary Fickle, uh, two letters from Linda Fleming McGinnis, Garrett Furlong, Gail and Bruce Gillespie McGinnis, Hugh and Kim Grafton, Susan Greenham, Neil Haynes, Trevor Hesselink, Don and Diane Hilliard, John Hauser, Robin Hunter, Mike Johnson, Susan and Mike Johnson, uh, Donald Lee, Steve and Natalie Marlette, Joanne and Dave McKenzie, Michelle Maritzi, Vic Mishner, Sarah Milne, Jen and Mike Malloy, Ned Morgan, Sonia Mount, T. Newman, and I think we have two letters on that one, Terry Newman, uh, Bob Peel, Amy Phelan, Clay Phillips, Leslie Piercy, David Port, Steve Prest, Judy Prima, Peggy uh, Rayburn Bell, Dean and Lou, Alan Reed, Kim Reed, Rick Riordan, Vincent Rogers, Ross Rossette, Lori Shifley, Doug Sexton, Fran Smith, Linda Stevens, 
Perry Taylor, Susan Taylor, Carl Tribe, David Trumbull, Robert Valley, Barry Ward, Dan White, Tisha White, and Jennifer Zimpel. Um, just a summary of the some of the key points, seven key points that came out in a lot of the letters. Um, uh, many have indicated they, they're not against the development, but they want to see it happen in a way that fits into the community and consistent with the OP. Uh, they're concerned about increased traffic and safety concerns. Uh, they note that the height is too high, uh, restricts view of the bay and is not compatible with adjacent building heights. The proposed density is too high for the lot and res residential area. Should include more open green space and include linkages access to the waterfront. There's concerns regarding water and sewer capacity and it should include more pedestrian friendly plan. So those are highlights of some of the comments. Uh, not to uh, summarize in too many, <laughs> uh, too limited details in that we will consider all of the comments within those, but that's our, those are just some of the key highlights in the comments received to date. Thank you, Rob. Um, we have with us our Gray County Senior Planner, uh, Scott Taylor. Um, Scott, do you have uh, some comments that you'd like to offer at this time? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Compass and, and members of council and everyone joining us on the meeting today. I'll keep this very brief. Um, I'm here uh, on behalf of Gray County, and I'm going to be working alongside uh, Rob and the staff team at Meaford to, to process the applications. And I'm mostly here tonight to listen and to take note of all the comments. And it's fantastic that we have so many comments already in writing and so many people joining us. Um, I did, however, just want to clarify one aspect because there's a number of the comments, as, as Rob has mentioned, um, that make, uh, make reference to the density. Um, and I certainly don't wish to, to, to debate the density or anything else, just certainly to, uh, to clarify the county policies in this regard. Uh, the 2019 county official plan uh, refers to 20 units per net hectare as a minimum density um, in our, our fully serviced uh, uh, communities across Gray. So that would be communities like Meaford that have both water and sewer services. Um, we recognize through the county plan that, that there's going to be different densities across your community and, and in some areas it will be higher and certainly any area where you might have things like an apartment uh, building or a long term care home, even areas in your downtown. Um, the density will exceed that 20 unit per net hectare um, basis that's in the current county official plan. Um, and so the county wasn't looking to prohibit um, any, any um, density that was higher than that, um, but we recognize that within municipalities such as Meaford um, and within exercises like your official plan, uh, as we heard about earlier with the official plan review, um, that's where you can really uh, look at what density is, is appropriate for what specific community. Um, I know there was some confusion in some of the comments as to why uh, such a development would even be considered going above uh, 20 units, um, but I, I did just want to clarify that that 20 units is, is the minimum density, not the maximum. And so with that, I'll, I'll be quiet. I'm certainly here to answer any questions later on if there are any, um, but I look forward to hearing all the comments from, from council and members of the public. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, uh, Councillor Vickers? Councillor Vickers? Yep. Thank you, Thank Your you. Worship. Rob, Rob the, uh, when you started there, you said the Saugeen Mady and Canada Post uh, Enbridge and another one, they didn't have any comments. You, you talked about them, but I, don't, I didn't quite pick up that uh, whether they had any comments or not. So I just want clarification. You're on, on mute, you, Rob. I'm sorry. Sorry, Your Worship. <laughs> First time today doing that unmuted, <laughs> not muted. <laughs> um, yeah, no, there was nothing. Uh, they were just saying, thank you for the application. We have no no objections or concerns with it for those. So that's why I didn't highlight them. The only one that provided any uh, substance was the Grace Alba Conservation Authority. And that's why I elaborated on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. So now I will ask uh, the applicant to review their proposal in more detail through a presentation that they have prepared. We have uh, Carrie LaMarche, Edward Thomas, Erica Bailey, and Chris Pigeon will now have the opportunity to present their proposal to us. Welcome folks. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I had to do the unmute thing now, Rob, it was my turn. 
<laughs> I'm not sure if everyone can hear me, um, but thank you so much, Your Worship, uh, members of council and staff, for the opportunity to meet tonight with the residents of Meaford. We're really pleased to share our concept plans for the mixed use redevelopment of the former Stanley Knight hardwood flooring factory site at the intersection of Fuller and Boucher streets. Um, I'm not sure if um, someone could pull up our presentation. We did pull together a bit of an overview to share with you uh, tonight. Um, and uh, we'll start by introducing the team. Um, and so if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Carrie LaMarche and I'm the Vice President of Development with SkyDev. And this is part of the Skyline group of companies. Skyline is a Guelph-based real estate company and has grown over the past 20 years to be a national provider of rental housing, retail shopping, clean energy, and industrial real estate focused exclusively in small and mid-sized communities across Canada. Skyline is a long-term owner. We make a strong commitment to incorporating sustainability features as well as giving back to the communities that we're a part of. Joining me tonight is our principal planner, Chris Pigeon, Edward Thomas, who's the project architect, and Erica Bailey, our transportation engineer. Other project team members include uh, Walter Fady, who's our civil engineer, Golder and Associates, who have completed the ecology, geotechnical, and environmental assessments on the property, as well as ASI archaeolo the I always mess that word up, archaeologists. Next slide, please. So tonight we will start by presenting a bit of an overview about our proposed development, including a summary of the technical reports completed. We'll provide details on the current applications as well as outlining the various future planning and building permits required before construction can commence. And most importantly, we're here to hear from you, answer your questions and understand your comments. We plan to move pretty quickly through a presentation to allow lots of time at the end for questions and comments. For ease of reference, we've included a slide number in the bottom right corner of each page. If you could please just note this slide number as you pose your question, it'll allow us to flip to this slide and have a bit more context around the question that you're asking. One of the exciting things about this property is the long history of the site and its contribution over the past 100 years to help form Meaford into the thriving community we see today. We plan to incorporate into the development various ways to celebrate this history. And for us, this starts with the naming of the proposed project. And if we could flip to the next slide, I'm thrilled to announce tonight that the official name of the community will be known from this point forward as Knights Harbor. As we continue in the design process, we will add in other features to uh, pay homage to the history, such as the name of the park, adding historical uh, memorabilia and photos within the lobbies of both the apartment and hotel, and other ideas that we'll come up with along the way as we move through design. Next slide, please. This aerial photo shows the site in and around 1950 and highlights the thriving industrial hub that this site once was. The factory is located at the top of the photo with the railway and roundhouse at the bottom of the photo and adjacent stockyard where I'm told livestock were brought in for transport. This certainly was a hub of activity for the community. The brownfield cleanup and redevelopment of, the, redevelopment of this property will allow for much needed rental housing to be constructed with Meaford's vacancy rates at virtually zero today. We also plan to add a hotel and associated amenities such as a spa restaurant to the property. This development will bring both much needed housing as well as full and part-time jobs to the community, all within the existing urban boundary of Meaford. We're excited to bring this site to the next phase in its evolution and again contribute to the vibrancy of Meaford. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Edward, who's going to walk you through the concept for Knights Harbor. Edward? Thank you, Carrie. Uh, next slide, please. So um, here we have a, a view of the uh, site with approximate area of six acres in area the and the waterfront uh, area that's uh, owned and uh, going to be improved by the municipality of Meaford. 
Our site is uh, located along Fuller and Boucher Street with Fuller to the north and Boucher um, running east and west. Next slide, please. So here I'm gonna walk you through the site plan. I'm gonna give you an overview of the site. I'm gonna be explaining the types of buildings, where they are on the site, how cars and people will move through the site and use the site. And then I'm gonna walk you through the outdoor amenities that we're proposing and where they are throughout the project. So on this side, on this slide that's in front of us, we have Fuller Street that runs north and south and we have Boucher Street, Boucher Street that runs east and west. So I'm going to... Um, excuse me, I've got a howling cat in the background. Um, we have um, Fuller Street running north and south, and at the intersection of Boucher and Fuller, there is um, proposed two-story townhouse units that's where the number two is. And then as we move up to where the number three is, that's two rental apartments with underground parking and rooftop amenity spaces. And as we move towards the waterfront to the left where the number one is, that's the proposed hotel and spa that will have underground parking and approximately 90 units. To the east of that, we have three blocks of stacked townhouse units, and those would be four stories in height with, um, with rooftop amenity. From there, um, these are the placements, and I'll talk more about the rationale behind that placement in a few minutes. From there, we have um, access for vehicles and pedestrians all along Fuller Street and all along Boucher Street. At the north end of Fuller Street, which is in the top left corner, there would be vehicle access for services for the apartment buildings. This would be such as uh, deliveries and garbage pickup and maintenance vehicles. And then as you move south along Fuller Street, you come to the intersection of Bridge and Fuller, and this will be a, a major access point for vehicles and pedestrians onto our site. If you're coming by car, you would come up Bridge Street, you'd cross over Fuller onto our site, you would turn to the right, and that would be visitor parking uh, for guests for the hotel. And through that parking area, you could move to the ramp that would take you to the underground parking for the hotel. If you came from Bridge Street and you cross into our site and you turn to the right, that driveway would lead you to the underground parking for the apartment buildings. If you continue straight forward, you come into the parking lot, which would be essentially for the residents and visitors for the townhouse units that are along the waterfront side. Back on Fuller Street from the intersection of Bridge and Fuller, if you came south, there's an entranceway into an area that we refer to as parking lot two, which is for visitors and residents of the apartment building. As you move further south along Fuller, there's driveways and front doors for the two-story townhouse units along Fuller, rounding the corner and going east on Boucher Street we continue with driveways uh, for the two-story townhouse units. And as you move further east, you have an entranceway back into parking lot two. Parking lot two would also be where you'd have loading and services for the apartment buildings. And one of the reasons we have a connection from Fuller to Boucher Street is to allow for the um, larger vehicles to be able to drive through the site so uh, emergency vehicles, um, moving vans, uh, garbage trucks, there'd be no need to reverse onto any of the municipal streets. They could drive straight through in a safe manner. As you move further east, you come to an entrance that would take you to the underground parking of the apartment buildings and further east, another entrance into the parking lot area that again, that's for the residents and visitors of the townhouse units. 
With respect to pedestrians, there's many accesses from the municipal streets and access through to the waterfront. So for example, from the intersection of, of Fuller and Bridge, you could walk up Bridge Street, cross over Fuller, walk onto the site, following the sidewalk, you could get access to the hotel, access down between the hotel and the townhouse units to the um, uh, waterfront park area. You could also follow the sidewalks in front of the townhouse and in front of the apartment buildings and continue your way all the way through to Boucher Street. Next slide, please. This is an aerial view of the site plan that we were just looking at. So to the left is Fuller Street and to the right is Boucher Street. And at the bottom is the intersection of those two streets. We have the two-story, excuse me, the two-story townhouse units. And then moving to the center are the apartment buildings and the townhouses and, a, along the waterfront. And to the left is the proposed hotel and spa. The reason that we place the buildings where we have and the scale of each of the buildings in, the, in those locations are that we felt quite strongly that rather than having four or five story buildings along Fuller and Boucher Street, we felt having two story townhomes would be the appropriate scale and transition from the existing neighborhood onto our site. So from there, we move to the middle of the site where we have the apartment buildings and we have rooftop amenities on those units that you can see here. And then we have the hotel close to the waterfront and at the uh, north end of the site. And then the apartment buildings along, um, sorry, the townhouse units along the waterfront. You can also see that we're proposing to have a lot of street improvements along Boucher Street and Fuller Street. We'd be rebuilding those streets, providing street trees and a boulevard, new public sidewalks that take you both towards David Johnson Park, as well as to the east and out to the proposed um, waterfront improvement along the lake shore. The um, other aspect that's maybe a good time to point out is that the townhouse units would be condominiumized and the uh, maintenance and upkeep of the yards and uh, parking lots and everything associated with those condominiums would be maintained by the condo board. So all the, um, everything would be kept up to snuff is essentially what we're trying to say there. Next slide, please. With this view, it's an aerial view looking from Georgian Bay, Georgian Bay at the bottom, the municipal uh, shoreline and park area, moving into the townhouse units. To the right is the hotel and David Johnson Park. And then in the center are the apartment buildings and the townhouse units to the top. The rooftop amenities that we're proposing for the apartment buildings would be essentially for the residents of the apartment building. It would give each and every resident views um, over the town and out over the water. Some of the amenities that would be on the rooftop would be outdoor barbecue areas, community gardens. It would be a very active space and we anticipate that they'd be well used and enjoyed by all the residents. The townhouse we're showing um, here we have at grade, there would be terraces in front of the lower units, and then there'd be rooftop private terraces for each condominium unit on the top of each of the townhouse units. We're also assuming that the operator of the hotel would um, see the benefits in having rooftop amenities for the hotel and spa as well. So in the following slides, I'm going to show you some of the proposed outdoor amenities and views of the project. But while we're looking at this slide, I'll just help orientate you on the views we're going to see next. With the townhouses at the top of the page, there would be an active park area that would, the townhomes are surrounding. 
and that would have a link down to the outdoor amenity space at grade between the apartment buildings, which then continues down between the apartment building or between the townhouse units and out to the waterfront. Next slide, please. This is an area, um, again, by the townhouse units that we see as a very sort of active park. Here we're showing it, um, proposing it to be uh, an outdoor play area for four kids. The theme of this park would be based on the uh, roundhouse that existed on the site, and that would be the inspiration for the landscaping features and, and design themes of the landscaping of this active park area. And then from here, you'd be able to move down um, across parking lot two into the outdoor amenity for the apartment buildings. Next slide, please. So this is a view of the at grade outdoor amenity space between the apartment buildings. And uh, between the apartment buildings in the background, you can see the townhomes and that's where that active park area was moving down through here. And this is maybe a less active um, outdoor area, but still very much, we think be very much appreciated and used primarily by the residents of the apartment building. And you could move down across parking lot area two towards the townhomes and then towards the water. Next slide, please. So here is a view of the stacked townhomes that would be along the waterfront. This is the um, view looking at the interior units or the ones looking into the site. And here we would have the um, parking lot area two, which I'd point out that we would be doing traffic calming um, amenities such as speed humps and stop signs to make it a very much a bicycle friendly area as well as sidewalks on both sides of it to allow for a pedestrian friendly area. There would be uh, terraces or gardens in front of each of the entrances on the lower units. And you can see the upper private terraces um, for the con condominium townhouses here. To the left would be a continuation of that walkway from the active park between the apartment buildings and down towards the waterfront. Then we would move on to the next slide, please, where we have a view of the um, stacked townhomes from the waterfront side. So here you can see again, we have the private terraces and entranceways into the, into the units. And this boundary between the public and the private would be a, a soft landscaping uh, boundary. So there would be, um, uh, it would be a gentle way to uh, help people define what's public and what's private. So that includes my, my portion and I'd be pleased to answer any questions at the end of our presentation. Thank you. Next slide, please. So Council on the Public, it's Chris Pigeon with GSP Group. I'm planning consultant for SkyDev. As a part of SkyDev's due diligence in the acquisition of this property, they thoroughly reviewed the Meaford Waterfront Strategy and Master Plan. And then we entered into discussions with the Municipality of Meaford to understand the expectations. And as Edward and Carrie indicated, the waterfront is currently and will remain owned by the municipality. The master plan for the waterfront improvements anticipates a boardwalk to be constructed, some of the trees to be cleaned up and the vegetation, and to make an inviting extension of the existing David Johnson Park, and to ultimately interconnect the waterfront back into the community along Boucher Street. So this is just simply schematically illustrated in this uh, visual to show what that meandering boardwalk could look, look like, how it would connect back into Boucher Street and the sidewalks that will be constructed by SkyDev as a part of this development plan. At, at Meaford's request, we simply prepared the schematic design as an illustration, knowing that the improvements will ultimately be designed and constructed by the municipality. Next slide, please. 
So again, this is an at grade visual of what the waterfront boardwalk could look like as it meanders through the trees and cleaning up some of the vegetation under those trees to provide views of the waterfront. And then in the backdrop is the proposed development. Next slide, please. There are five applications required to realize this proposed development. Tonight, we're here to present the first two applications. The first is a zone change application ultimately required to be approved by the municipality of Meaford. And the second is the vacant land condominium that Scott Taylor spoke of, and that ultimately rests with the County of Gray for, for approval. The vacant land condominium really deals with common areas such as the internal roadways, services, landscaped areas, and it provides for common ownership and it's simply a means of holding on to that, those land holdings and then sharing in, in those uh, infrastructure requirements. There are three other future applications. A site plan application really deals with the exterior of all of the buildings. It includes grading, servicing, sidewalks, driveways, landscaping, lighting, and the exterior cladding of the buildings. It will be future building permit applications for each of the buildings. And, and the building permit really deals predominantly with, with the interior of the buildings to make sure that it is Ontario code compliant. And then finally, there will be future standard condominium applications to deal with the townhouses. Again, that'll be applications submitted and ultimately approved through the uh, County of Gray. Next slide, please. The existing Meaford official plan designates the property as special policy area one. That is just a portion of that designation what extends to the lands to the Southeast. So other industrial properties. So this designation is to encourage redevelopment of the former heavy industrial site into a comprehensively planned pedestrian oriented mixed use development that ultimately becomes a catalyst for the redevelopment of those other industrial waterfront lands to the Southeast. Next slide, please. The site has two zoning classifications that apply to it currently. The broader development or D2 zone is a development holding zone that anticipates future redevelopment of the site to be determined through the current zone change application. The second class of zone that applies to the site is that green area in, this, in the bottom right hand corner. It's identified as the environmental protection or EP zone. And that zone relates to Meaford Creek that cuts across the corner of the site. And ultimately that land area is proposed to be conveyed to the municipality of Meaford per, for preservation or conservation in perpetuity. Next slide, please. The proposed zoning to be applied is the Meaford residential multiple zone. And that zone permits apartments and townhouses and is proposed to also permit hotel and commercial uses such as restaurant and spas associate, a spa use associated with the hotel with site specific setbacks and parking standards. Next slide, please. As I indicated, and as, as Rob uh, Armstrong's indicated, the environmental protection zone lands are proposed to be conveyed to Meaford. And as well, there's the unopened road allowance. So that's the bottom graphic, which is uh, uh, an extension of Bridge Street that is considered to be surplus and ultimately is proposed to be purchased by SkyDev to be added to the development lands. Next slide, please. There are a number of technical reports that have been submitted in support of the rezoning and the vacant land condominium applications. Those reports are in circulation to a broad range of commenting agencies, such as the school boards, the Gray Sobel Conservation Authority, and the various departments and of uh, Meaford and Gray County for, for review and comment. Next slide, please. We're not going to present to you all of these reports, but some of the key findings. So the archeological assessment did not find any archeological artifacts of significance on the site. 
The uh, environmental site assessment, uh, the site does have construction materials, debris, and metals that are impacting the site, and they need to be remediated before redevelopment for residential use can proceed. The geotechnical report find, finds that bedrock on the site in some areas is within 1.7 meters or about six and a half feet from the surface. And SkyDev continues to monitor groundwater levels as a part of the site remediation for this project. The functional servicing and stormwater management report confirms that there is adequate servicing using existing infrastructure. So that includes the existing water mains and sanitary sewers are appropriately sized to accommodate this proposed development. And finally, we'd like to highlight some of the reports that we thought that the public would be particularly interested in. Next slide, please. Golder Associates completed an inventory and, and assessment of environmental features in and adjacent to the site. So they included looking at species at risk, aquatic and fish habitat, habitat for threatened or endangered species, and all flora and fauna both on the site and adjacent to the site. The findings were that there were no significant features but they did recommend that a 30 meter setback be imposed where no development is to occur adjacent to Meaford Creek. And of course, that's the EP lands to be conveyed to the municipality. Next slide, please. A traffic impact and parking study was prepared. SkyDev's traffic consultant prepared terms of reference that was approved by Meaford before undertaking any work. In Paradigm, the, the transportation traffic consultant on this project has been working with the municipality of Meaford on every step of the way through the preparation of this traffic impact study. It included the investigation or evaluation of seven intersections in proximity to the site to determine how those intersections are functioning today before any development takes place and any necessary road improvements as a result of the proposed development. The traffic study methodology relied on traffic counts that were provided by Meaford in 2019 and 2020. Those traffic counts were then augmented with additional counts that took place earlier in 2021. In a traffic study, the methodology projects normal traffic growth in Meaford 10 years into the future, so to 2028, excluding traffic that would be generated as a result of the development. So the normal growth in traffic is evaluated to determine how they would uh, affect these intersections. Then the traffic generated by the proposed de development is modeled and it is added to the growth in traffic to 2028 and assesses any deficiencies in the existing street network. The conclusion of the traffic impact study was that all intersections will continue to function at acceptable levels of service with no need for road improvements. SkyDev recognizes the challenges of assessing traffic volumes as a result of the pandemic. We all know that traffic volumes are way down. So SkyDev has committed to undertake an addendum to the traffic study in the peak summer months, in the peak summer season, and present those findings back to the public at a future public meeting. So there will be an additional traffic study done this summer, submitted back to the municipality of Meaford, and there will be a subsequent public meeting to present that information. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed this slide. Next slide, please. There was also a parking analysis that was completed for the proposed development, and it had included an assessment of parking demand for similar uses in other municipalities, using industrial standards for parking justification and implementing something called transportation demand management uh, measures to quantify parking rates. So they include charging for parking to match parking demand to actual need, unbundling or sharing parking between uses, alternative modes of transportation such as bicycle parking, and the proximity of amenities in the downtown to the proposed development. Next slide, please. This table illustrates parking for 11 municipalities similar to Meaford 
where, for example, there is no existing public transit. For all of the municipalities, the par parking demand for multiple residential use was less than one parking space per residential units. So that's the, the column headed vehicles slash per apartment. The proposed development anticipates a minimum, par minimum parking of 0.9 spaces per residential use and 0.75 spaces per hotel room. These are minimums and SkyDev ultimately anticipates that parking will range between 0.9 and 1.25 spaces per unit. Next slide, please. Finally, we'd like to spend just a few minutes on the planning justification report relative to land use planning from the province and the official plans. The Meaford official plan and the waterfront master plan anticipates that this site will be comprehensively planned from its former heavy, heavy industrial use to act as a catalyst for future redevelopment of the industrial lands along the waterfront to the Southeast. The redevelopment will be a mix of residential uses, a mix of residential tenures, so that's rental and owner occupied housing. And it will include commercial uses that support and do not compete with downtown Meaford uses. The proposed development needs to be compatible with surrounding residential uses through, through careful building, parking and access placement and building heights. And the proposed development must promote pedestrian connectivity around and through the site. Next slide, please. We believe we have achieved compatibility. The two-story townhouses fronting the existing residential uses, Front Boucher and Fuller Street, they face on to the existing residential, low-density residential uses on those two road allowances. Only the ends of the five-story apartment building touch Fuller and Boucher. Surface parking areas are generally internal to the site and they are hidden by the proposed buildings. The waterfront townhouses frame Georgia Bay, and there will be a clear delineation between the public waterfront lands and the condominium lands. And finally, rooftop amenities on the apartment and waterfront townhouses will augment the green space on the site. Next slide, please. Eford's official plan indicates that the maximum building height is to be th three stories, but it can be increased to 15.5 or five stories subject to the provision of community benefits. In this proposed development, the community benefits are numerous. They include the rehabilitation of a former heavy industrial site that was used as a sawmill, flooring manufacturing, stockyard and railway. The contribution to the waterfront vision, which is a significant increase in the usability of the waterfront for the public. Street rehabilitation and streetscape improvements, including sidewalks that interconnect the waterfront for public usage. Pro providing a variety of housing types and tenures, including much needed supply of rental housing in Meaford that has a less than desirable 3% vacancy rate. Environmental sustainability elements. A hotel is a long desired use for support of the downtown and the harbor and the payment of significant fees for development charges and parkland dedication to help pay for the infrastructure and community improvements. Next slide, please. And ultimately, as a community benefit is to provide great connectivity to the waterfront. On the long side of the site, on the waterfront side of the site, that distance is about 1000 feet of frontage along the Meaford waterfront lands. It is a very long block and this development proposes to provide numerous public entry, po entry points to the waterfront, in including the future waterfront boardwalk. And that will provide a looping effect for pedestrian connections around the site and through the site for the benefit of the broader general public. Next slide, please. In terms of next steps, the county has asked for an addendum to the planning justification report to address the county policies relative to the condominium application. That will be submitted next week. In addition, SkyDev has committed to an addendum to the traffic study to capture high summer season traffic. That report will be submitted this summer and SkyDev commits to host future public meetings to present those findings. The applications are currently in circulation to the various agencies for review and comment. 
SkyDev is, is proposing to submit a formal site plan application in the coming weeks for the development. And ultimately, Meaford staff and Gray County staff will be preparing reports to set out recommendations to councils on the applications. And this is not anticipated to take place until into the fall of this year. Next slide, please. Mayor and council and ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our presentation. And uh, we would be very pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, uh, that, that presentation. Um, I will now open it up um, for, for questions. Um, and uh, we have a list of individuals who have registered with our legislative services. And uh, we will begin with uh, in the order that they appeared. Uh, Rob, you have a comment first. Yeah, just uh, for the purpose of, of flow and, and getting through the meetings, I think, or through the comments, I think what we would like to do is have the, the comments and questions raised. We won't actually uh, respond to them Fine. after each one. Um, so have those go through and then at the end, the applicant can respond to those um, at the end of the process just to allow the, uh, we'll exist our IT in, in the back and forth for sure. So. Yes, of course, that's uh, the best way to, to handle this, I think, rather than individually address the, uh, the issues. So if uh, we may then begin with uh, uh, John Earl is our first speaker. Welcome, John. Thank you, uh, Mayor uh, Compass and uh, uh, Council. I, um, my name is John Earl. Uh, my wife and I own a residential property at 199 Bowser Street East. We've been here since 2005. And um, I wanted to uh, state our strong objections to the proposed Sky Dev development and to ensure that we have a right to appeal to the local planning appeal board should council approve the required zoning bylaw amendment. The development proposed by SkyDev does not comply with the popula population density and building height restrictions of Meaford's official plan. Um, it exceeds the previously mentioned uh, 20 units per hectare by a factor of seven times because this development has a density of approximately 140 residential units per hectare. It also exceeds the, the present uh, building height restriction of three stories, uh, since it's proposing to build five stories on the hotel, the apartment buildings, and uh, I'm not sure if it's four or five stories on the waterfront condo units. It would destroy the existing residential neighborhoods surrounding the subject property, which are comprised of single family residential lots. It would obstruct the water views and it would lead to a devaluation of all of the surrounding properties. The increases in traffic and population density would not be acceptable in this established residential area. I believe that Meaford Council has a responsibility to ensure that the existing property owners in this area are not adversely affected by the proposed skydive de de development and that they should not approve it or allow it to proceed. Instead, Council should consider the unique nature and value to the community of the subject property. It is the largest vacant waterfront property remaining and available in the town of Meaford. We should follow the example of many other urban municipalities in the Georgian Bay area and seek to acquire municipal ownership of this valuable asset. This would allow continuing public access and use of this land for the benefit of all Meaford residents and visitors now and into the future. Thank you. Thank you, John. And next we have Hugh and uh, Kim Grafton. 
Hello again, Council, Mayor Klumpus. Um, I have a number of issues with changing any of the zoning for this proposal. The two blocks adjacent to the proposed development site, and if you, as uh, Skydev said, would refer to their slide number six, you can see that the two blocks adjacent, which would be from the Harbor, Fuller Street, Bridge Street to St. Vincent, and from Fuller, Bridge, Bowsher to St. Vincent, that those two blocks are larger area mass than what the proposed site is. And at present time, there are 38 residential units in those two combined blocks. And using SkyDev's own factor in their uh, justification report of 2.3, that would give 88 people living in those two blocks. SkyDev's proposal, as and as quoted in their stormwater management report, there would be 730 people occupying at minimum that development and that does not include the 90 hotel rooms or the occupancy of a condominium that I might mention if you read their justification report is what they will build if they cannot get a hotelier online to build the hotel. I don't see how that is compatible in any way with the existing low density residential neighborhood. Those figures cannot be compatible. There's no way you can reorganize them. And not only that, if you take that for the traffic, if one third of those 730 people leave in the morning in their cars to go to work, to go to get their coffee at Tim Hortons, our streets are going to be jammed. I don't think that this is an acceptable rezoning measure. I would also like to say that it, they are trying to mitigate the um, heights by saying that they are doing transitional building. And that also is not true. I think if you look at slides seven and nine in uh, Thomas's presentation, I live at 124 Bridge Street, which is right on the corner of Bridge and Fuller. And absolutely adjacent to my house is the corner of the five-story apartment buildings. There is no transition. I will be looking at a wall of concrete. And the other view I have is of the five-story hotel. That again is no transition. I also will be living directly across from the hotel parking lot. And as they had just mentioned, the service entrance for garbage trucks, snow removal, et cetera. And that will impact my, my property, my house significantly. This proposal, as it sits, does not fit with our official plan. I don't think rezoning it is a wise idea. I don't think it is fair to the existing residential neighborhood. I think it will have a significant impact on our health as neighbors, on the environment as our neighbors. And Hugh and I strongly, strongly object to it. We also have an issue with selling, or I guess it's not selling, but the giving back of the EP area as if SkyDev gives it back to the town, they will no longer pay taxes on it. And I can see why they don't want to own it. There's nothing they can do with it. So it's useless to them. So let's give it back to the town as a gift. I don't see that as a gift at all. It's land that they will use as green space for their tenants. 
I, I don't see the benefit to the community at large of that at all. Thank you very much, Kim. I'm going to hold you to the five minutes. Thank you. Thank you for your, your comments. And we'll move on to Steve Marla, please. I don't know if Steve's uh, with us, uh, okay. Mayor Compass. All right, then we'll uh, mark it uh, that we'll move on to Jennifer Burak. Thank you very much, Mayor Klumpus and uh, Council. I'm a new member of the Meaford community and I'm very thrilled to be in this beautiful town. Um, I really believe in mixed use space and I really believe in having a variety of housing types in a community. Not everyone can afford a single family home um, and I'm certainly not against development. I think it's positive and I think it's going to happen. Um, but I also believe in careful planning and also in design. Um, and I'm very concerned about, and now I realize that there are probably artists renderings in the um, Skydev proposal, but um, I have to say that it would be a real shame uh, if Meaford did not consider strongly you know, the architectural and design elements um, for a, a development like this. Um, we don't want something that's gonna be cookie cutter that we see in the GTA. I, I, you know, I, I think Collingwood is another example of just overdevelopment, um, uninteresting development. Um, think about towns like Niagara-on-the-Lake and Stratford, Ontario, and there are so many charming places. So. I just, I, I really think that design and, um, and space is really important. Looking at that design as well, at the proposal, I agree that five stories is too high. I think those apartment buildings, we, you know, apartments are needed for people. So no objection to that, but it's just too dense. Um, there isn't really enough space for the community. It's just really walkways between buildings at, as far as it looks to me. Perhaps, you know, reducing one of those buildings, lowering, you know, five stories to three and having perhaps a central square, maybe a music garden, maybe something to, related to arts and culture. I think there's a lot of opportunity to make this an incredibly fabulous place and it's just packed and very uninteresting at this moment to look at. Uh, so I think lowering the density, uh, also too many parking spaces, perhaps going underground for some more of them. Um, I just, I, I think more work has to be done on this. I think it's too dense and I think, um, it's just such a charming town. And I think Meaford is just, really positioned to create, um, to, to vision, to do some visioning. So uh, I, I just kind of, I know I'm a rambling a little, so I'll stop there, but thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for your time. And we'll move on to Eric Ennis. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Am I coming through okay? Yes, you are. Please go ahead. Perfect, thank you. Um, so as some of you know, I'm 25 years old, uh, so I'm a young person, a young voice. I'm serving on the Economic Development Advisory Committee and I'm connected to and involved with a number of community interest and service groups. I'm a relatively new uh, resident in Annan and despite growing up in Mississauga, I've always been paying attention to Meaford through my grandmother who's lived here my whole life. So as a young adult, I decided that I wanna build my life here because I don't appreciate the lifestyle and the opportunities offered in the GTA. And I think most, if not all, Meaford residents relate to that. <clears throat> Further, uh, I think that most residents can also agree that a good community is one that values absolute well-being and absolute quality of life above all other factors and uses these as the standard to judge decisions by. These things take a community from the place to be for the weekend and, uh, or to the place to be to live well. When a decision is made, we have to ask, have we made a net improvement on our quality of life and that of our neighbors? 
The goal is to inject significant, meaningful improvement into as many people's lives as possible. And looking bottom up, this is a difficult thing to evaluate because there's just too many factors to consider. But we humans can also uh, have incredible top-down processing abilities. And a commonly mentioned example of this is first impressions. And like when meeting people, we develop surprisingly well-informed gut feelings about situations, ideas, and events. And we know when things don't add up. And when I look at this proposal, I get the gut feeling that it doesn't make sense for Meaford, at least in its current form. And it seems that I'm not alone in that. Aside from well-being and quality of life, we also have to think about sustainability and making sure that our community is going to last into the future. And I'm particularly passionate about this because in 30 years, I'm going to be, no offense, your age and dealing with any decisions that you make today. And thankfully, I've heard some great points from Council in the last little while, and it seems like all of our neighbors are on board too. For example, I've heard pragmatic arguments from Council that we can't jeopardize farmland for suburbia because where else is our food going to come from? And I've heard romantic arguments that we can't jeopardize beauty for suburbia because Meaford's beauty is one of its biggest draws for residents and tourists, and it's a source of everyday goodness for everybody that's here. We all agree that Meaford, Gray County, and beyond shouldn't look up to the pave and sprawl strategy of the GTA as a role model. So as much as uh, I and seemingly like most other people, um, I support building up instead of building out. And although this project is designed with the former in mind, I feel that it's missed the mark. Building up works really well when it's combined with walkability principles, enabling people to live within an efficient walking distance to essential amenities, uh, so they don't require a car to survive. And making the assumption that people have cars or worse, requiring them to have one to live is a critical and systemic failing in North American culture. And Meaford's in a unique position to learn from this and do better before it's too late. Skydev said tonight that their project is pedestrian oriented, and that's a good aim, but the residents will not want other people milling around their houses. The closest store of any kind is almost a kilometer away. The grocery store is 1.6 kilometers. And so it's obvious that they're building for drivers, not pedestrians and cyclists. So how does this proposal match to our standard? Does it make a net improvement on our quality of life and that of our neighbors? One of the GTA's worst traits is traffic. Anyone who's lived there can tell you. And waiting at red lights and stop signs degrades day-to-day -day experience. With the Boucher Fuller location, we're mandating that a large number of people live in a place that requires them to drive to survive. And then that driving is gonna to have to be mediated and moderated with more stop signs and street lights. Degrading quality of life, uh, increasing cost of day-to-day -day living, removing the opportunity to do your part for the shared environment. Uh, it just degrades quality of life for everybody living nearby. So to Thank me- Thank you, Eric. Can I ask you to wrap up, please? Sure. Um, Essentially, Skydev's website says that they have a focus on sustainable initiatives through conservation, production of energy, conservation of water, transit choices, and other efficiencies. If these initiatives are a focus, and if there's something to be proud of, why didn't they mention them? So at this time, Skydev doesn't meet our standards or their own. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And so we'll move on to uh, Diane Hilliard. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Compass, Council, Meaford staff, and SkyDev representatives for allowing the residents of Meaford to speak here this evening. My name is Diane Hilliard, and I, I have to say I'm really impressed with the impassioned deputations I've heard so far. I can't wait to hear the rest, and I do hope you all feel the same way. 226 Boucher Street is a gem of a waterfront property. It's a pivotal piece of land at a critical time in a community that is on the tipping point of greatness. I'm speaking tonight to ask you, our members of council and Meaford staff to please remind yourself of this with every decision you make regarding this application. Our very own official plan identifies this area specifically and it denotes special policies for both the municipality and prospective developers to be guided and abide by. They are referenced in urban special policy areas. Thank you for speaking to it, Mr. Thomas, however, I feel you may have missed a few things. Six, to be exact, the SkyDev proposal falls under the special policy area number one. Within the vision for special policy area number one, there are six development principles listed, which should, and I quote, guide the redevelopment of the special policy area number one. 
Six principles. Six principles to follow for good development in this special area. Contrary to the presentation with sweeping statements on benefits, etc., the current application from Skydelt falls short on five of them, and one is marginal to fail on one. Let me elaborate. Development principles, section B1.8.1.2 of the OP. The lands will be planned and redeveloped in their entirety as opposed to being developed in an ad hoc or piecemeal basis. Fail, that's not happening. This is one of three parcels of land. And by looking as, at this as one application, we are precluding the intention of cre creating continuity along our cherished shoreline and perhaps even designing an undesirable precedent. B, the lands will be used for suitable mix of residential open space and commercial uses related primarily to hospitality, tourism, and service sectors. Fail, without cancel, council adding a holding provision as a requirement of the development in conjunction with this zoning amendment, there is no guarantee of a hotel. Thus tourism, hospitality, and service would be non-existent. What happens if SkyDev does not secure a hotel here? C. The development will be compatible with surrounding residential uses. Marginal to fail. There are no detached dwellings within this proposal as there are on Fuller and Boucher. Stacked and jammed, all are multiple unit buildings. D, the development will create and improve linkages to existing open space and harbor lands and will maintain public access to the waterfront. Fail. The public access to the waterfront is hindered and limited at best. One must traverse through a parking lot and then narrow pathways between private condominiums to access the proposed boardwalk. E, the development will provide pedestrian spaces and access to the waterfront and will minimize the amount of space used for parking cars. Fail. This proposal cites 235 surface spaces for parked cars on a 2.42 hectare lot with an additional 127 below grade parking spaces. What part of that is minimized? And F, the development will support the objectives of the urban area waterfront designation and the waterfront strategy and master plan. Fail. Here are just three of the guiding principles that were not followed. One, promote the urban waterfront as a gateway and focal open space area. Hmm. Two, Enhance the physical and visual connectivity of the pedestrian circulation and links. Three, promote excellence in design. Red brick and pavement. A to F, those are the six development principles of the special policy area number one. Who wrote these six development principles? You did, the municipality of Meaford in 2014, and we will review it again this year. Will we wipe out that section? Surely not. We will strengthen it. We will enforce its implementation, and by this, we will provide the basis for managing growth that will support and emphasize Meaford's unique character in a way that has the greatest positive impact on the quality of life and overall health of the residents of Meaford. Great statement, eh? Thank, well, thank you, Diane. I'm going, your, you well, to, I'm going to ask you to, to wrap up now. Yep. I will. So, Mayor Clumpus. Members of council and Meaford staff, please do what you are not only entitled to do, but what we as residents implore you to do. Ask SkyDev for revisions that improve their mark of one for six. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. And we'll move on to Perry Taylor. Can you hear me? Yes, please go okay. ahead. Good evening, your worship, councillors, staff, SkyDev representatives and fellow residents. My husband, Andrew, and I feel that the pending SkyDef proposal has a number of areas of great concern. Density, height, parking, neighborhood compatibility, lack of usable open space. There are arguments to be made in every category, but we have two questions for council. First, will you be approving a bonus zoning provision for the SkyDev development? As we see it, the official plan states quite clearly that with regards to height, three stories is the max. But the provision of this bonus, and I quote, shall generally be applied in the urban area where council deems a greater height is necessary and appropriate to accommodate a proposed development which maintains the general intent of this plan, end quote. The general intent of this plan as stated in the OP 
is not to allow five stories on almost every structure on the site. The general intent of the plan is to ensure that the scale, massing and development is compatible and consistent with development on adjoining lands, not setting a precedent for those adjoining lands. There's no need to have five stories on so much of the development as it only creates more traffic congestion, lack of sufficient parking for all those units. And in the case of the apartment buildings, a total eyesore of a brick wall as the centerpiece of the site. This bonus provision, if approved, creates a density of almost 80 units per hectare when our official plan has a recommendation of 20. That's an enormous jump, which is not justified in our opinion. Skydev's application for this bonus provision, when or if it happens, must be turned down. Send them back to the drawing board. Rarely is a first concept the acceptable concept. Ask them to redesign a more reasonable use of the land, Ask them to consider this opportunity to create something to be envied, not held up as what not to do along spectacular waterfront. Ask them to respect our official plan. The current development is too high. It has too many units per hectare. It has a lack of usable green space, which is blatantly ignoring Meaford's official plan. And it has created a regrettable amount of pavement, which by the way, isn't even enough parking to satisfy all those units creating other obvious issues. So our second question to you, Council, is are you doing your best to ensure this special policy area number one gets the development it deserves? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Perry. I appreciate your uh, coming to it today. And so we'll move on now to Kimberly Rogers. Hello. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Councillors, staff, Scott, SkyDove and Skyline reps. I hope I didn't miss anybody. Our family has been uh, rooted firmly in Meaford for the past 12 years. Originally from Wellington County, we were drawn to Meaford for its four season lifestyle, drivability to the GTA and its unsurpassed beauty with its all encompassing vistas of the Bay. From the moment you descend down Sykes at the intersection of Paul, where the road slightly jaunts to the right and suddenly your eye captures it. The blue oasis between those gorgeous historic buildings. It beckons home, you've arrived. We are not the second cousin of Thornberry. We are not the town without its own magnificent history. From three carriage factories, two tanneries, sawmills, a foundry, two flour mills and an outstanding 10 hotels. We're Hollywood famous. We've been pe featured in One Magic Christmas. We're a town with bragging rights. We've thrived, we've grown, and as we journey ahead, we have much to preserve, but more importantly, we have much to plan for. And as developers arrive, we are excited about the possibilities and potential for our town, but not without reservations over the fact that it appears many of these developers are leading the way. You are our elected officials, our representatives, our voice, the decision makers. We ask you to pause, review, plan, ask questions, seek expertise before making commitments and changing the fabric of who we are and who we can become. There are discrepancies in the SkyDev proposal versus the Meaford OP. Things like density and height. The official plan states 20 units per hectare in contrast, SkyDev's proposal is about 80. Are we so committed to development that we veer away from our vision for the town? The visual appearance of the proposed five stories that blocks our most precious asset, the bay. Looking at the renderings from SkyDev's proposed development, one gets the illusion that it will be open, encompass park-like green spaces and walking trails. But after exploring the site, with these buildings, there is little room left. It is a small segment of land with large density plans. From a design perspective, there is little imagination in showcasing our history and the bay. Large red brick buildings are anything but appealing. This development is going to set a precedent. We ask that you, our representatives, don't change the OP to reflect the developer's needs. We have invested our time and confidence in you to represent us. It's your job to invest in us and your community. 
That's worth saying again. It's your job to invest in us and your community by requesting an alternative plan from Skydove that provides a clear view of the bay, low density, unencumbered green spaces, and a solid alternative to a sea of red brick with little imagination. Insurances that the unnamed, unassumed hotel will not become condos or apartments. These are the musts. Thank you for working on our behalf. Thank you for your comments, Kimberly, appreciate it. Uh, next, we go to Christina McKay Brody. Hello. Hi. Hi. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, thanks for uh, letting me uh, speak this evening. So, um, my family is very deep rooted um, in this municipality. Um, early 1800s, emigrated into Bogner and then spread out throughout Meaford. Um, the current home that I live in, my husband family has lived in this home um, since the very early 1970s. Um, I am not against development at all. I am against um, properly planned and supported development. There's a few things that um, really caught me off guard when I went over um, the, uh, their, their plans tonight that I saw, one of them being their traffic report that they had had done. Um, that, that is too, too little. Um, if you go down 26, down St. Vincent Street, that is a main artery to the harbor and to that area. That was only looked at according to that uh, traffic report that was done uh, to Boucher Street. So that's not, not even close to being um, acceptable in my opinion. Um, I have a few other things that uh, really need to be looked at. The uh, green space that they claim to have there, that is not enough for any amount of children, families, et cetera, even just visiting that area. Um, yep, we have, we have a beautiful harbor and I don't wanna see a bunch of little kids running down that, that street coming from this, this huge development that's going in or that wants to go in. I, I think that needs to be more looked at um, when it comes to green space that way. Um, I also have a problem with the um, facade of the whole, every building, I just keep shaking my head. Um, there is absolutely no heritage, no history, and no form of architecture that even comes close to even what Meaford is now. There's no individuality, even in those um, condominium townhomes that they're talking about. They all look just like they came from a city and each one's going to have to look the same. Um, and that's, I, I, I would not want to be a house right across the street from that. And that's not the way I should feel living five blocks away myself. I should want to be visiting there just as much as someone coming up from anywhere else. So one of my questions also is to Skydev themselves. They talked about um, full-time and part-time employment um, for residents in the area, which I applaud. I think that's very much needed, but are they gonna be able to afford to rent any one of those units? That is a huge question for me because right now we don't have affordable housing. And they keep saying, you know, we don't have, you know, 3% or whatever it is. For, for rental? No, we don't. But I, I just can't see them having apartments that people will be able to, to afford um, at their, their place either. The other question I have um, is about the waterfront. I understand that from what I was looking at that the municipality of Meaford would, would take responsibility for right against the um, the, the waterfront, the, the beach area, 
Um, but who's going to be responsible for Mother Nature when she kicks up another 10 feet and takes that out? And then that becomes now sky dev development land. Who's going to who's going to fix that? Who's going to be responsible for those charges? Again, I'm not against development. I it needs to happen. It's just I think this is the wrong the wrong way. Um, I'm not saying that that residential housing isn't needed or hotel isn't needed, but it just needs to be done with much, much more thought. Um, Thank you, Christina, but your five minutes is up. I appreciate you coming. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll move on now to Reed Barrett. Thank you, Mayor Clumpus, and uh, thank you, Municipal Council members, for letting me speak tonight. This is a great opportunity to speak to the SkyDev development proposal on the waterfront shoreline of Butcher and Fuller Street. Uh, my name is Reed Barrett, my spouse is Petra, and we're both full-time residents in this beautiful community of Meaford. We purchased our property 16 years ago and have enjoyed uh, the Georgian Bay community uh, throughout all its seasons, and uh, we're proud uh, Meaford uh, residents. We welcome new development and change that would contribute and enhance Meaford's amenities. Growth is not a detriment and can enhance the overall quality of life for our entire community. The property proposed for this development is indeed special. It's waterfront property, it's very limited, it's a very limited asset in Southern Georgian Bay, and it's a prize for Meaford. However, the results of this development we feel could be troublesome for Meaford. The concern is much more about the compatibility of this development and the fit for this particular property. Although the property is prized waterfront, it is indeed very small for the volume of proposed development. Additionally, a complication of this property we've heard tonight, it's under a unique category under the municipal uh, official plan. It's required to conform to special policy area number one and multiple uh, development principles that's found on page 50 of the official plan and it's mapped on schedule A1. Many of these principles appear incongruent or completely absent in this proposed development. The development principles are very prescriptive stating the following principles shall guide the redevelopment of this special policy area number one lands. The first principle indicates that these lands will be redeveloped in their entirety as opposed to ad hoc or piecemeal. These lands in their entirety include Fuller and Butcher, but extend to Marshall and beyond almost to Margaret Street, as shown on the map in Schedule A1. It'd be helpful to understand how approving only one parcel of land in isolation would meet this guideline of the approval of the approved fit official plan. Uh, we could be premature until we understand how the remaining parcels will be developed. Currently the plan outlining three five-story buildings, 72 stacked and 14 traditional townhomes and 90 unit hotel, all resulting in a density four times over the official plans proposed average and providing insufficient parking for a community without public transit. At this density and layout, the site appears overbuilt and in direct conflict with other principles, such as pedestrian oriented, maintaining public access to the waterfront, uh, minimizing the amount of space for parking cars, improved linkages to open green space, uh, this development in its current form would also seriously tax the existing community infrastructure for water, sewage, traffic, parking, uh, and represent less than adequate compatibility to the existing character of Meaford. So I would encourage the municipality, council, and residents to review and push back on this proposal to consider the other parcels of land within the special area and alternatives that would better fit the community reflecting the lifestyle of Meaford. Thank you once again for this time and consideration to make this development the best that it can be for Meaford. Thank you, Reed. Uh, Brenna Agnew, you're next. I'm not sure we have Brenna with us. Okay, then we'll move on to Cindy Slee. 
Thank you for this opportunity to make this deputation. I wrote to seven council members last Monday about a few of my concerns, and I'd like to personally thank councillors Bartley, Kentner, and Greenfield, and Deputy Mayor Keevney and Mayor Klumpis for replying to my email. I believe that SkyDef's present plan does not reflect the intent or direction of the official plan for Meaford. Meaford's plan was developed for a reason and was thoroughly researched to protect and preserve our environment and have our town grow in a responsible and harmonious way for all the rel uh, residents who are the voting citizens of Meaford. There are numerous areas of high concern for our town with the present SkyDep proposal. The plan suggests 296 units, including the hotel. SkyDev proposes 80 units per hectare, which is huge. Our official town plan dictates 20 units per hectare. Big difference. We must also take into account the majority of units will have two or more residents. Also, many will have two vehicles. Then you must add the visitor parking, the hotel staff requirements to this already heavily congested area. In one of the latest reports, SkyDef plans to charge a fee for parking. If this were to happen, our side streets and harbor area will be overrun with parked cars just to avoid the parking fee. We also have to look ahead. What does this dense population mean to Meaford? Our beaches will be overcrowded. Our hiking trails, parks, Oy. fishing, garbage, snow removal, medical and emergency services will greatly increase. What is going to happen to the residential streets that lead to the development? Bridge, Fuller and Boucher. Of course, they will be inundated with truck and equipment travel traffic during the years of the building process. Also, our newly renovated bridge that crosses Big Head River on Bridge Street will have a huge increase of traffic over this narrow bridge. Let's not forget the new four-way stop that has this vicarious corner that I have personally witnessed several vehicle and truck near misses. On January 27th of this year, a traffic camera was set up for two days by the town to monitor traffic flow by the corner of Bridge Street and St. Vincent. On those two days, we had considerable snowfall and by no means would reflect typical local traffic at this intersection. SkyDev has committed to another traffic study this summer. Hopefully this will change the statement on page 47 of the official plan updated by Rob Armstrong that was sent out last week stating, no traffic improvements required. All roadways and intersections will continue at acceptable level of service. Really? Roads in the area will definitely need work. What are the taxpayers of MEFR going to be paying for? The road structure and repairs, sidewalks, street lighting, water and wastewater services that will be required? I hope not. There needs to be a realistic costing done and not taken out of the taxes, but directed to the developer. We certainly don't want what has just happened in Collingwood to happen here in Meaford. This huge development is on prime property that is adjacent to our harbor. The look and feel of the development needs to properly reflect the surrounding area. We do not need or want the industrial appearances of bricks and mortar but something that takes in a nautical theme of a small town by the water. And the last- Andy, can I ask you to wrap up, please? Yeah, and the last point I'd like to make is some of the proposed buildings are built to five-story level. This directly contradicts Meaford's official plan. I strongly urge our elected council to reject this existing proposal from SkyDev with no addendums. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, moving on to Susan Taylor. Mute. Good evening, Mayor Clumpus, Deputy Mayor Keaveney, members of council, municipal staff, and Great County planning staff, Meaford re residents, and SkyDev co-representatives. 
As residents of the municipality of Meaford, my husband and I wish to notify you that we strongly object to SkyDev's application in its current form. First, let me say that my husband and I are pro-development. We chose to build in Meaford for the quality of life. We are supportive of infill projects and intensification. Having spent a portion of my career as the president of an architectural services firm, I have worked on numerous large and small scale projects, including university buildings, regional headquarters, commercial, industrial, and retail buildings, as well as nonprofit housing and custom residences. In 2019, I had the pleasure of serving on the municipality's Economic Development Task Force. Given the pandemic, there has been little to no opportunity for residents to meet in person with council, staff, and or the developer to discuss the impact of this development. While we were able to watch SkyDev's virtual presentation this evening, the speakers you are hearing now are not visible. We are merely voices without faces, sharing our deputations for the record with no opportunity to engage in constructive conversations. For that reason alone, we would ask that both Meaford and Gray County set this matter aside until such time as it is safe to hold a public meeting. If we are not able to gather together in person in the near future, then at minimum, it would be helpful if the municipality were to host a town hall style virtual meeting with a moderator so questions can be asked and answered by the appropriate parties. Let's work together to find solutions that preserve or pay tribute to our heritage while creating neighborhoods that we can be proud of for years to come. For the sake of brevity, I won't go through the detailed letter that I have written and I will share it with you in writing tomorrow, but suffice it to say that density, height, mass, compatibility, parking, pedestrian or as people have already noted, SkyDev fails in all these areas. Many solutions could be explored. Communities often require multi-story buildings to conform to different step backs on each floor. This approach can reduce the scale of a development to more acceptable visual levels. It can reduce the loss of daylight and consider the impact of wind and snow. The effective use of landscaping can also have a dramatic impact on a neighborhood. Given the prime location, we have the rare opportunity to imagine a development that could become a landmark, a drawing card on Meaford's waterfront with the potential for adjacent waterfront boardwalk to be developed by the municipality. This is prime real estate that deserves an award-winning design. Perhaps residents may choose to prioritize energy efficiency as a key component. We won't know unless we get an opportunity to chat. As a side note, in 2018, the city of Brampton created a blueprint for new growth based on a collaborative approach, a creative way of meeting public health, climate change and social equity goals. In North Brampton, they're creating 20 minute walkable, healthy neighborhoods with connections to mass transit corridors. While this model may not be the right fit for Meaford, it is a reminder that scale matters. What appears not to have been taken into account is that many amenities would not be within easy walking distance. The lack of local transit combined with the fact that many families require two vehicles to get to work presents a challenge for parking space. In conclusion, earlier this evening, SkyDev indicated that they will be submitting a formal site application for the development within the next few weeks. In regards to the notice of complete application and public meeting and notice of proposed closure and sale, my husband and I asked that both Meaford Council and Gray County Planning defer decisions on this matter until such time as, a, as the public has had the opportunity to meet virtually or in person to review the project in more detail and have our questions answered. 
Many residents will welcome a development that meets the needs of a growing community while respecting our small town heritage and protecting our natural environment. There is a wealth of local talent that would likely be willing to dig in and help SkyDev create what could well become one of the jewels on our waterfront. Please allow residents the opportunity to be heard beyond this evening. If Council truly believes that collaboration is the new meet, new leadership, then lead by example. Create a forum for residents to engage in meaningful conversation about the future. This is an ideal opportunity to build bridges within the community, to create opportunities to pull interested parties together and find solutions. When we look back 10, 20, 50 years from now, we will all be glad we took the time to get it right. I did it. No mute. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, Bruce Robinson. Thank you very much, Your Worship, members of council and staff and guests of SkyDev. I've been busily, busy scribbling out a lot of things, so to minimize the degree of repetition here. And uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to appear before you. In summary, it is so discouraging to see a large, sophisticated, an experienced out-of-town developer put forward a development that demonstrates a complete lack of deference for our community, our official plan, and the property's unique feature and location within our town. As many have spoken to, it's too dense, too high, incompatible with adjacent development, provides negligible open or community space, and contributes nothing to the town or its residents. Further, it will not meet the town's housing objectives, which would just compound the failure. It represents nothing but poor planning and land use, which is what this is all about. I, I am a lay person and it's clear the proposal doesn't square with the official plan. The planning justification contained in the material is so weak, which should have everyone question the veracity and opinions within the entire submission. As an example, because of their desire to maximize density, and therefore profit, there is limited parking. And so they therefore rationalize a parking ratio less than one and state there'll be minimal traffic impact, which is just plain wrong, as many have spoken to tonight. To anyone who's, who drives through town or they're trying to get to work or to school. And I also believe based on what was stated today, it, it disregards a significant impact on traffic will be seen with previously approved development on um, on Highway 26, Meaford Haven and Loon Call. For context though, over the past 10 years in particular, Meaford has experienced a reasonable amount of development, which on balance has been successful and should be commended. Developments like Albury Court, Ironwood, and townhouse developments off Victoria Street and Graham Street. Why have these developments succeeded? They're smaller in scale, they respect adjacent development and are infill locations. They fit into the community, add to the tax base, and do not have a material impact on town services and infrastructure. More recent proposals, I don't really want to harp on it too much, they will not be as successful. And they should be instructive to council and to staff in this instance. Loon call will end up being an example of poor planning. Despite the passionate submissions by others in the community, the objectives of which, namely attainable housing, I support. There's a strong likelihood this development will fail our community from the perspectives of attainability, integration of the town fabric, open space, and more importantly, livability, and as somebody mentioned, quality of life. Let's not pile onto these shortcomings with SkyDev. I'll briefly touch on the, 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 the official plan, the B1 8.1. Again, this is a special area. It was advertised to me as a special area back in 2004 by my real estate agent when I end up buying my house. At the end of the day, it gets embodied in our official plan. So we now collectively need an understanding of the overall plan for the entire development and how any sort of proposal fits within it. No one else has touched on this, but I'll touch on it quickly. As for the land swap, this does not appear to be a fair trade. The town is getting environmentally protected land, which is of no value whatsoever. And exchanging valuable development property especially by selling to SkyDev, which 
is likely, if it's them or somebody else, that is the highest and best use. And we must, we must maximize the value on the sale of any of the town's assets. It'd be helpful to understand the logic behind that, as well as understand the impacts on the development should the swap not proceed. It just sort of seems like it compounds an inappropriate development. I'll, I'll, I'll close by saying, you know, I strongly recommend the planning department and council reject the SkyDev proposal and not proceed with the land sale at this time. It's so wildly off base and out of proportion, and there's no framework or context in which to evaluate the land swap. While excellent, we have limited planning resources in our town, and they should be directed to working on more appropriate opportunities. That said, the proposal should be the catalyst for the town in accordance with the official plan designation to determine how those lands should best be utilized to serve the current and future residents of our community. And it could actually form the starting point to be creative and actually achieving some of the social goals previously articulated by council. Thank Let's you, understand. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks. your time. Thank you. We'll move on to Vivian Grant, please. Thank you to Mayor Klumpus, councillors and staff. My name is Vivian Grant and on behalf of my husband and my family and myself, I'm presenting this deputation. And I thank you for the opportunity to have our voices heard on a topic that is very near and dear to our hearts, the flavor, tranquility and the safety of our neighborhood. We've been residents of Meaford for 15 years, roughly. We left our home of 33 years in downtown Burlington as we felt the lovely little town we once adored was changing faster than we could imagine. High rises, townhouses, condos and the likes were springing up and changing the, the face of the once sleepy downtown community. We understand that progress is necessary, but after watching the chaos and indiscriminate building going on there, we chose to leave. We chose Meaford for its small town feel, its tree-lined quiet streets where children and pets and the elderly felt safe and calm to wander. The historical homes add to the charm. In our opinion, the looks of the sky depth development doesn't enhance or blend with the surrounding homes at all, and that should be a concern for everybody. Um, we trusted then that the bylaws and town planners would protect the community to maintain the general feel of a cherished community. We had faith that even in the light of progress and real estate expansion to this area, which we know is necessary, that the people in the town, those in control, would care seriously for the flavor of the town and not fail, fall prey to major developers. Stick to the official plan for it was made for a reason. The proposed sky dev development is blatant lack of adhesion to Meaford's official plan on so many points. It breaks so many of the predetermined rules that we that have been laid out by the town. And again, for some particular reasons at the time. In no way does this proposal remain compatible with the adjacent real estate in the proposed area. A small patch of green space, which is where the sky dev is proposed to go will become a massive eyesore and the small town feel of the town will be wiped out, making it more in keeping with the likes of Mississauga or Toronto, and sad to say, even Collingwood. Collingwood itself is another story, but maybe halting further development for their own reasons, but too little, too late. The damage has been done there. My grandmother used to say, once the toothpaste is out of the tube, you can't get it back in. So this reference wasn't to building or town planning, but the point is well adapted to this scenario. We must as a community think long and hard before allowing massive monstrosities to be built in our small community, especially with such density. We're not against progress, but we want our grandchildren to experience the feel and charm of this town, walking the streets without fear of traffic, playing green spaces and breathing air that is clean and fresher than in other communities. That's why we moved here. Focusing on traffic, the only way to access this parcel of land is through two very quiet residential streets in the area. Those streets are meant to be residential and, are pro and the proposal or the proposed development brings the potential for at least triple the amount of cars that both these streets combined now offer. So much for young children riding their bikes safe, safely on the sidewalk or the elderly of the community walking without a care down the sidewalks. If this goes through, there'll be a steady flow of traffic that is consistent with city living, not town living. And it is too much for this small parcel of land tucked away with no major road access other than the now quiet residential streets. Just the sky dev proposal may possibly bring in 400 extra cars or more alone. I won't even mention the con concentrated pollution this 
springs, let alone traffic jams. Uh, when we first moved to Meaford, we had no problem crossing Sykes from where we live, but now I'm telling you, you have to wait a while before you can get a break in traffic before any of this has been done off these two side streets. So let us not also forget that there are adjacent parcels of lands that will be developed. So add this to the monst monstrously dense population of this just one site and the amount of traffic that this will all add to Boucher and Bridge Streets is crazy. These two sites alone for which there are no other roads other than the two current residential streets could potentially bring in an excess of 800 cars or so it is unfathomable amount. Heartbreaking is what comes to mind. This doesn't even take into consideration the parking situations that will be raised by these needs, including hotel staff, uh, any other workers there. And again, somebody else mentioned that um, the fallout will end up being all the side streets will be parked on. So this land is a jam of the community. This proposal is ludicrous at best, unless the idea is to jam as much density and as many different types of buildings as possible. It is not in compliance with the vision and rules that the town now has in place. So why is it even being entertained? Let's hope that Meaford stands strong for what it believes in and better yet, let's hope that before there are any further developments anywhere in Meaford, that there's a strong vision and a plan for all that is encompassed in developing a town, not just for today, but for the future. This includes realistic traffic analysis, realistic traffic analysis, because whatever analysis was done in January is not at all representational of what happens here in the summer months, not even in the winter months, really, if it's not COVID. And the other thing is, um, the amount of density in that particular site is, there's gonna be so much spillover and that doesn't even include the fact that the beaches are already eroding, let alone being jammed with people from out of town. So our green space, it has been diminished and this, there's very little green space in this proposal. Thank so, you very much, Vivian. I have to uh, move on here. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Laurie Stevens. Okay. I was just about to say. Is Laurie with us? Yes. There we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor Clumpus and members of council. My name is Laurie Stevens, and I would like to express some concerns I have about the SkyDev development on Meaford's waterfront. My spouse and I are Meaford residents, transplanted Torontonians who made the decision five years ago to retire to this beautiful town. We are not newcomers to this area. We have been coming up to Southern Georgian Bay since 1981 and were weekend homeowners in Craigleith from 1987 to 2016 before purchasing our retirement home at the eastern edge of Meaford. We retired here for many reasons, not the least of which is all of the wonderful amenities Meaford has to offer. We love going to concerts at Meaford Hall and dining at all of the wonderful restaurants. We ride the Georgian Trail, walk the waterfront, hike the local trails, and frequent grandma lambs and other local businesses. From our perspective, Meaford is a gem. Its small town charm is exactly what we were looking for when it came time to leave Toronto and settle into a much more peaceful and civilized life. We respect the need for Meaford to grow. It is essential for the health and well being of its citizens. However, it's imperative that any development that happens in Meaford is true to what this municipality is all about and respectful of the needs and desires of its residents. Meaford's waterfront is a beautiful asset. We understand why SkyDev has an interest in developing this parcel of land. However, in reviewing the SkyDev plans and Meaford's official plan, it is clear that this development has some serious shortcomings that fail to respect the character of our community. We have three concerns. Meaford's initial plan, official plan calls for an average target of 20 units for every hectare of land. SkyDev's proposal is much higher, closer to 80 units per hectare, and this includes the stacked townhomes along the waterfront. While increased density can prevent sprawl, we believe this proposal greatly exceeds what is necessary and right for this parcel of land. Meaford, second, Meaford generally restricts heights of buildings to three to four stories. SkyDev is proposing two five-story rental buildings, a five-story hotel, plus the stacked townhouses. If this development was proposed from Midtown, the heights of the buildings would be less of an issue. However, excessive height along this particular parcel of land will affect the ability of residents to enjoy the waterfront. And once one developer is allowed to do this, others will want to follow. 
One only needs to look at Toronto to see how excessive unfettered condominium development along the lakeshore has restricted views and access. And third, there is a serious lack of green, safe, green space set aside for this development. Skydev indicates that it will build a small park, but it is behind the townhouses and next to a parking lot. Would it not make more sense to have a larger park along the waterfront where families can gather and kids can play? In addition, I have looked at Skydev's track record in residential development. In short, anything that was built in the last 10 years was done by its parent company, Skyline, whose license appears to have expired in 2012, according to the Terry on Builder directory. Yet Skydev's website makes it very clear they have many development irons in the fire in many municipalities, raising concerns about their capacity to deliver on the condominium townhomes they propose to build and sell. In conclusion, I respectfully ask that Meaford Council considers our concerns about the development, asks hard questions of Skydev, and ensure that this, ensures that this project is, um, is a, that if this project is approved, that it better reflects the character of Meaford and the needs of its residents. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laurie. Appreciate your comments and your time. Council, at this time, I need a motion to extend. We have been, uh, we've exceeded our three and a half hours or will very quickly. Thank you, Councillor uh, Bell and a seconder, please. Councillor Greenfield, all in favor. And that is carried, thank you. Council, do you need a quick stretch, five minute stretch? Yes, okay. We'll, uh, we'll recess for five minutes to, uh, well, 8.35. Uh,
Okay, thanks everyone. And uh, let's carry on at 8.35, we will uh, resume with uh, Rick Riordan is our next speaker. Uh, Mayor Klumpus and Council, SkyDev representatives and fellow residents, uh, hello again. Uh, my name is Rick Riordan and my wife and I are residents of Meaford. Thank you for this opportunity to present concerns regarding the SkyDev proposal. Let's be clear, it's not the lack of densification and excessive height that has stifled the economy in the town of Meaford over the past 20 some years. Rather, I propose it's been the failure to transition from a manufacturing based economy to a tourism based economy that leverages the opportunities of Meaford's unique geographical location on Georgian Bay. Meaford shares many of the same advantages that an outdoor lifestyle community like Kelowna enjoys, hiking, biking, boating, fishing, water sports, skiing, etc. Arguably, Meaford has the most beautiful shoreline on southern Georgian Bay. We understand from our recent conversations with Council that the tax base for the municipality has largely been supported in the past uh, by the surrounding rural areas. The town harbor and waterfront public spaces of the municipality have remained for the most part underrealized. There may be many reasons why this hasn't been initiated earlier or imagined into reality, uh, but many in our community see this as a missed opportunity. SkyDev's proposal should be better aligned with this opportunity. Respecting the special policy designation as it relates to this property, we're hopeful about the good growth and welcome development that works respectfully with the official plan and waterfront strategy undertaken by the municipality in 2014. Regarding SkyDev's proposal, I would simply echo the very obvious concerns that have already been expressed to you and to SkyDev. The excessive height, the massing of development for the size of the lot, the extensive surface parking area, the lack of green space for residents within the property, and the failure of this proposal to be considerate of its neighborhood context as prescribed in the OP for this special waterfront par parcel. We understand the proposed hotel near the harbor front with the tourist focus was a key piece in consideration of the SkyDeb proposal in early discussion with council and in compliance with the parcel designation. In a recent Zoom conversation with Imagine Meaford, Greg Jones, CEO of SkyDev, as well as Carrie LaMarche, VP of Development, expressed less certainty about this component of the proposal. Given the impact COVID has had on the hospitality industry, SkyDev has apparently not been able to secure a hotelier for the site, and at this time could not guarantee that, they would be that that would be included as part of the project. Imagine Meaford residents proposed that the guarantee of a hotel be a built-in contingency of their permit. SkyDev wasn't open to this idea. Long after COVID, a hotel in our harbor area will remain an essential need. Of course, there are other legitimate concerns related to the industrial institutional nature of the proposed design and its architectural appropriateness for the surrounding community. While we understand the current trend of architecture leans towards an industrial aesthetic in urban centers, this is no way reflecting the overall identity of Meaford as, an, as outlined in section A, the vision and land use concept community vision of the official plan. Carrie LaMarche in her response to residents following that Zoom call references, we believe converting a hardwood floor manufacturing factory to proposed uses of rental apartments, condominium townhomes, and a full service hotel will enhance the waterfront and the surrounding community. If the hardwood manufacturing building was still standing, perhaps another conversation could be had, but it hasn't for some time. Perhaps a historic plaque might serve as a homage enough to the property's history with respect. As professional design consultants, we took time to source images to illustrate and vision cast contemporary architecture style that interprets three of Meaford's distinctions for residential heritage, agriculture, waterfront. 
This was sent to Skydev and Council in earlier correspondence. As such, a modern farmhouse vernacular might be more suitable uh, as a design style. The community is less about an industrial brickworks aesthetic. This development may be an opportunity for Skydev to show their diversification for residential development, design that is complementary to the established residential surroundings rather than leanings towards large and larger urban center development. Instead, a style sympathetic to an agricultural and small town community. Skydev should said that they would consider this. I would appeal to council that further consideration regarding the Skydev proposal for Meaford is required. We implore you to use your power uh, as, as our representatives. We have an opportunity to shape our town, in particular, this unique gem of a property. As a council, what legacy will you leave for future generations? Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Right on time. I appreciate that. And we'll move on to Gary Green. Please go ahead, Gary. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please there we go. go. Ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, Your Worship and Council. Uh, I wanted to begin by saying that the people in Meaford, and it's the people that I'm hearing speak tonight, really do realize that what they want, they already have. And, you know, related to this, this I'm going to call this employment land. Uh, I was just, just, we just heard Rick speak a minute ago. A hotel and conference center in this location with adequate meeting space, but keep it to three to four floors would benefit me for greatly, I believe. And, you know, I come from a family that ran Paul's Hotel on the site where the uh, new Meaford uh, library is right now. Um, this uh, a hotel would create employment. It would bring people to Meaford and it would bring in tourist dollars and it would you know, allow people in Meaford to, to clean and, and, and cook and have some jobs. Uh, so it would be a great, uh, a great idea. Um, Skyline has significant assets in hotels as we probably all know they run places like Horseshoe Valley Resort and many, many, many others, a uh, hotel in Cambridge. Uh, they're good at running hotels and hospitality business. However, from the presentation that I heard tonight, it didn't sound like Skyline was interested in running the hotel. And that is a big question mark. Um, and I think Rick alluded to that uh, as well. Um, really, in, in contrast, the plan Skyline is presenting to us tonight is predominantly housing. It's just housing. And it's almost all apartment buildings and all of that located, you know, on our beautiful waterfront. Like, really, uh, that's what we're looking at uh, right now. Um, Skyline's plan would bring hundreds more people to Meaford. But my question would be for what jobs? I, I have to go to building heights just for a moment. The proposed buildings to me are too tall and would contravene the Meaford official plan. Anything built above the tree line changes the character of the town and would set a dangerous precedent for future buildings. How do the so-called benefits of height in this development justify any significant public benefit? Skyline is proposing five floors plus rooftop amenities. And to me, this is just too high. Let's limit building height exemptions only to a few projects truly of public good, such as a new hospital. One day, Meaford probably will get a new hospital or long-term care home that will benefit the residents of Meaford. Aside from that, let's stick to the current planning heights as prescribed in the official plan. I do also want to address parking. Um, too few parking spaces per unit leads to parking issues. I know this from experience because I own one of the units in the big blue condo on the harbor at 34 Bayfield Street. This building has 36 units on four floors, 22 outdoor parking spaces and 30 garages. There's 15 up on the upper deck and 15 below. If two parking spaces per unit had been allocated 
to that building and they never were, there would be 72 spaces, but somehow the developer supplied only 52 spaces mm. or 1.4 spaces per unit. Skyline is proposing, and they told us this tonight, between 0 0.9 and 1.25 parking spaces for residential, which is, is truly not enough. Um, at 34 Bayfield Street, there is no guest parking. There's not one guest parking spot. I also didn't um, hear of any guest parking, uh, but, I, but I, I could be wrong there. I want to address wintertime snow removal uh, because at 34 Bayfield Street, that becomes a major problem. And it's a major problem in all high density developments. Um, it necessitates the trucking of snow away from the, the building and the parking lot. And it represents a very large expense for the residents of the condo corporation. And the residents of 34 Bayfield Street have to truck their snow away when they get a lot of snow because they have no place to put it. Um, also in Skyline's plan, there is some underground parking proposed. I would be a big proponent of that, uh, but is underground parking actually feasible on the shoreline of a Great Lake or might it flood? Uh, I heard tonight uh, in terms of the park in front that the town would be on the hook and be responsible for improving that parkland, not skyline. Not sure I'm a fan of that idea. Um, I agree the, the lot size and shape are peculiar for this particular property, and it's very difficult to come up with a design that works. It's a, it really does present a significant design challenge, but I haven't heard one person tonight that likes any part of the designs that were presented. Thank you, Gary. Uh, yeah. I'm going to have to move on now. Thank, Thank you, you, Mayor Columbus. Roz Rossetti, you're next. Good evening, Mayor Columbus. Councillors, Mr. Taylor from Gray County. My name is Ros Rossetti. I was lucky to have discovered me for 20 years ago and even luckier to have lived full-time on Pearson Street for more than 13 years. I asked to speak to you tonight to say, please send Skydev back to the drawing board. Skydev's proposal to cram onto the property bounded by Boucher and Fuller Streets and the Georgian Bay shoreline, 206 apartments and townhouses, a 90 room hotel, and something in the order of 250 above grade parking spaces, does not comply with the density requirements, building height requirements, parking requirements, or the vision for this property as described in the current official plan and the Waterfront Strategy Master Plan of April 2014. In the summer of 2013, I participated in public input processes hosted by Dillon Consultants, who were retained by the municipality to, I quote, develop waterfront specific policy recommendations to guide decision making in the face of future development pressures to urban waterfront lands and adjacent special policy areas. It was a priority for Dillon consultants to ensure that the planning process and resulting recommendations were comprehensive and inclusive. The recommendations of the waterfront master plan were based on input received from the community stakeholders, staff, and council. The property under consideration tonight is special policy area number one, a property which your predecessors had the wisdom to designate as special because of its proximity to the harbor and because it abuts a prime stretch of urban shoreline owned by the municipality and therefore by all of us. Some of the development principles and recommendations of the Waterfront Master Plan specific to this area were that the development will create and improve linkages to existing open space and harbor lands, 
provide pedestrian space and access to the waterfront, minimize the amount of space used for parking cars, and be compatible with surrounding residential uses. Also, height limitations and built form guidelines should minimize the impact of development and protect the small town nature of the municipality. And the provision of visual and physical access to the urban area waterfront should be ensured. These principles and recommendations are reflected in the official plan in section B18.1.1 and 8.1.2 for the special policy area number one. Excuse me. I quote, it is the intent of this plan to encourage the redevelopment of this area into a pedestrian oriented mixed use area. I repeat, a pedestrian oriented mixed use area. Furthermore, and again I quote, the lands identified in special policy area number one are considered to be in integral to this objective, given their location on the shoreline and immediately east of the Meaford Harbour area. I have read the planning justification report prepared by GSP Group for SkyDev, and I have walked along the perimeter of the property. I have great difficulty understanding how a development as dense as is proposed can possibly be construed as pedestrian oriented. When coupled with the parking requirements for the number and nature of the units proposed, it is hard to accept that there will be any welcoming usable pathways and green space on the property, whether for residents or for public use. The five-story apartment buildings will be both a visual and a physical barrier to views of and access to the waterfront. The five-story glass-fronted stacked townhouses will tower over any pedestrian pathway or boardwalk constructed along the waterfront. And to accept that the proposed development is compatible with the character of the existing residential area is a stretch too far for me to swallow. So please, I, Mayor please. Glass, thank you. Send Skydev back to the drawing board. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. We'll move on now to Catherine Haggard. Thank you, Your Worship and members of council. Um, I am Catherine Haggard, and I have lived in Meaford for close to 30 years. The parcel of land that Skydove is proposing to redevelop on the waterfront, as you know, falls within special policy area number one of the official plan. That means that redevelopment of these former industrial lands is contemplated and new structures will eventually appear here. I'm happy to see growth and development happening in our community. My concern, however, is that the site we've seen in tonight's presentation looks and feels like an overdevelopment of the site. This parcel is less than two and a half hectares. On a site this size, five large four and five story buildings occupy simply too much space. Moreover, little regard has been given to democratizing the waterfront, which is one of the principles in the special policy governing these lands. Instead of enhancing public connections, minimizing parking, we just see significant building footprints that block the waterfront and pedestrian linkages that conflict with the parking lots and car access onto the site. The large building blocks and heavy massing create a wall that keep people out instead of inviting people into the site. While I appreciate that any buildings here are going to make the site look very different from the way it looks today, that doesn't mean development should be precluded. Rather, new development needs to be creative sensitive to the surrounding area and should not become a barrier for residents to engage with their waterfront. I note the current proposal fails to give regard to two really important policy uh, initiatives in the special policy area. In particular, this plan is not pedestrian oriented space, nor does it improve linkages to the waterfront. I looked at an earlier rendition of the site concept by SkyDev on the municipality's website where the main path for pedestrians was shown through the middle of the site tucked between the five-story apartment buildings 
and not visible from the outside of the development. Pedestrians cross the parking lots to get to the waterfront, and I raised these concerns with the developer. Unfortunately, in this most recent version, and you'll see it on slide number 31, the current plan does the same. It just adds more arrows. So the pedestrians are directed to enter the site across motor vehicle ingresses and egresses, and pedestrians and cars shouldn't mix. Cars usually win. The new concept has not adequately addressed the challenge. I think there may be a better way. And I know there are a lot of invested residents who would like to offer to be part of a rethink of this plan. We've heard tonight from the developer that next steps will be to submit a formal site plan application for development in the next few weeks. My request to the developer is to commit to developing alternate site plan studies, different from what we have seen tonight. And with coordination and input from Meaford's planning department and input from residents in order to accomplish two important things. First, we want to create a visually appealing development that avoids the bulky wall of buildings that face the town and cut off the water. And two, we want to create a design that welcomes pedestrians safely into a mixed use community that is tourism focused and provides enhanced access to the waterfront. Redevelopment is contemplated here at Meaford's waterfront. It is contemplated as a mixed use development in the OP. And there are some great examples in the region. We don't need to be a copy, but the Village at Blue does blend multi-residential commercial uses and it is pedestrian oriented. There's a big square in the middle and it's full of arts and entertainment and people playing chess. The development draws people in, it draws tourism, it drives economic growth and there's no reason why we can't accomplish similar goals in Meaford. Again, not a copy, but something fresh and inventive that pays respect to this important piece of land and to the town. I would like to propose a community workshop take place, and this will take some direction from you, our council, where the developer and their architect, together with Meaford's planning staff and some very invested residents, may join together to try to design something that better addresses the principles that we've all spoken about tonight. And I'm hoping that SkyDev will also commit to a working session with the stakeholders prior to submitting a site plan. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Moving on to Susan Johnson, you're next, please. There you go. Good evening, everyone. I'm grateful to live in Meaford. It is the opposite of the congested city that I left. I said goodbye to traffic jams, cramped subdivisions, and hello to trees, trails, and open space. I am not alone in this thinking. People who have lived here all their life, as well as newbies like me, all treasure the qualities of this Ontario town. Currently, we have the opportunity to grow and develop while continuing to be a town that does not take on the negative characteristics of crowded urban centers. I am very concerned that the SkyDev development proposal leads us in this direction. One of the most troubling aspects is the density, which has been mentioned tonight, which more than quadruples the density target enshrined in the official plan, which is an overall average development density of 20 units per hectare not a minimum as mentioned earlier. I would like to see the number of units balanced with open space, which is essential for residents' well-being. After all, they will not have yards or recreational areas as part of their home. This balance of open space and units would be possible by upholding the density target to 20 units per hectare. And if we don't, it would set a worrisome precedent for future developments. As the SkyDev development lacks green space, I fear the onus may fall on the town to provide a park-like area for the development's residents. There has been talk of creating a boardwalk on the town's waterfront property for years. However, it is hard to imagine it would ever take the form of what is shown in SkyDev's renderings for both economic and environmental reasons. 
I'm also concerned that the waterfront would be completely obstructed by the wall of buildings suggested in the SkyDev proposal. At some point in the design, a clear view to the waterfront and open space should be established. The waterfront is a jewel in Meaford's crown. To hide it under a proverbial bucket is a mistake that would be regretted, as is the case of many centers that have blocked the view of their main attraction. Presently, the waterfront has small forested areas with established natural growth. These are key to stopping the erosion of the shoreline, as well as providing a natural buffer for the very powerful waves and winds of Georgian Bay. In fact, the environmental report provided by SkyDev recommends that the small deciduous forest next to the night property be retained. Since this adjacent forest property is owned, by Deputy Mayor Shirley Keedney, she may consider maintaining it as a forest for the many essential benefits it provides to our waterfront. As a side note, I am concerned that Deputy Mayor Keedney has been involved in discussions to this point regarding this development despite owning an adjacent piece of property. I also need to mention that the contaminated environmental state of a night property is very worrisome. The site has been identified in a SkyDev report completed by Golder Associates to, con to contain observed exceedances of contaminants of concern without, within soil. Meaford's waterfront strategy and master plan concludes that appropriate risk management measures for the site will require further investigation into the extent and source of the metals and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon impacts. Before any design proposal proceeds, we need to recognize that this site requires more study and to be cleaned up however possible. I would like to conclude by respectfully requesting council to assure that any development proposal for this site provide appropriate density levels as prescribed in the official plan, that the development provide necessary open space, that we maintain the natural forest growth by the waterfront, and that we allowed our treasured waterfront to be visible. At the same time, we need to be mindful of the environmental cleanup necessary to make this a safe site for development. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Danielle Hessel, you're next, please. Good evening, Mayor and elected officials of council and the wonderful residents of Meaford on this call this evening. I hope that everyone is keeping well during these very unprecedented times. And I really uh, appreciate you allowing me to have my voice in regards to the SkyDev proposal. I am speaking to you this evening to strongly object to the proposal by SkyDev for the property located at 226 Boucher Street East. This location is directly across the street from my home. <clears throat> and it will have devastating impacts on the quiet neighborhood, um, sorry, that is, will have devastating impacts on this quiet neighborhood. It is a high density proposal suggesting over 200 residential units plus a hotel. Currently, there are only 12 homes that face into this proposed site, all of which are one and a half to two story single family dwellings. As many have mentioned, um, Meaford's official plan that states the 20 hectare development or units per hectare is for development. Um, this proposal is not compatible with this well-established neighborhood. Meaford's official plan also states that it will maintain and enhance the character and stability of existing and well-established residential Meaford neighborhoods by ensuring that development and redevelopment is compatible with the scale and density of the existing development. There are only 12 homes on Fuller and Boucher Street that face this proposed site. Under the urban special policy section of the Meaford official plan, the developmental principle states that this particular plot of land shall be developed to be compatible with the surrounding residential uses, as well as the development will provide pedestrian space and access to the waterfront and will minimize the amount of space for parking cars. Again, this immediate intersection of Fuller and Boucher Street only have 12 single family dwellings. 
allowing this development to happen in this area will go against the official plan in so many ways that it will completely change the quality of life for the fine residents of the, this area of Meaford. When we moved to Meaford over eight years ago, the Stanley Knight Hardwood Flooring Factory was still up and running. Even at that time, this corner of Boucher Street and Fuller Street was a quiet, low traffic area in which many children have grown up and we have all become accustomed to. The Skydev proposal will drastically increase the traffic in this area, which we have recently seen while the bridge was out and the traffic was redirected from Bridge Street. This is a major concern for safety. I personally have had to witness many, many close calls with young children playing and people not being cautious while they were driving this detoured route. To pack hundreds of people into such a small parcel of land is major traffic hazard, which goes against Mayford's official plan, which states, it will not cause or create traffic hazards or an unacceptable level of congestion on surrounding roads. The SkyDev proposal will do just that, and that is the opposite of what the official plan states. These are two quiet residential roads. There are no major roads for access to the property at 226 Boucher, and this creates issues with access for residents and emergency vehicles alike. And it also puts a higher risk at our children that live in this area. Um, we moved to Meaford for the small town safety and the charm that it offered. Having moved from Oakville, we witnessed firsthand how development started taking over and the once beautiful farmland and is now continuous high density housing. We need to develop Meaford in a way which encompasses its small town charm and also creates attraction for new residents and tourists alike. I believe that this particular parcel of land should be used to create a large green space in which locals and visitors alike could enjoy the beautiful waterfront, along with a reduced number of residential units, I believe walking and cycling trails, a park, and a fully equipped splash pad, along with the boardwalk that would connect from downtown all across to the Blue Dolphin Pool, Skate Park, and Baseball Diamonds, it would be a much better option for this area. Once we allow this land to be developed to such a scale, we will not be able to take it back. We as the residents of Meaford need to ensure that ourselves and our future generations will have, access have accessible waterfront space to use. The SkyDev proposal will have a devastating impact on the quality of life for the residents of Meaford. Please consider the future generations and utilize this gorgeous piece of waterfront property for all of us to enjoy as we move forward in the ever-changing and growing development boom, which we are facing. You Thank are you, Danielle. That, I'm afraid we have to move on. Thanks for your comments. Uh, Linnea Nelson. Thank you. Next, uh, Linnea is not with us. Uh, okay, thank you. No, Nancy really Primack is next. Right at the very last line, pretty much. And then I was going to skip that and say that. Nancy Primack, is Nancy with us? Yes. Yes, yes I am. Hi, Nancy. Uh, hi. You're Good evening, Mayor Compass, um, counselors and SkyDev staff. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Council has a um, huge opportunity and responsibility in decisions made with the waterfront property formerly owned by Stanley Knight Limited. The density of development allowed here will set a precedent for the future of all development in Meaford. In five or 10 years time, will residents look back on the development allowed on this piece of prime waterfront property and say that wise decisions were made by the council in 2021. I feel the plan presented by SkyDev is far too dense for the municipality of Meaford. It is too dense for that location. It is out of proportion to the rest of the town and doesn't fit with the existing neighborhood. Watching the presentation tonight, the lack of green space was alarming. I understand that the developer's goal is to make uh, a profit, but council's responsibility is to ensure appropriate development that takes into account the best interest of its citizens, its residents. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. Carrie North.
Hi there. Um, sorry, Hi, there. sorry to Please. have taken a moment. Thank you yes, in sorry. advance uh, for lending me your time and attention while I speak. My concerns are with the protection of animal habitats and the health of the shoreline and bay waters. The SkyDev proposal, in my opinion, throws up more than a few red flags in this regard. So I would like to speak primarily about the environmental impact study completed on this proposal. The study has indicated that this site contains suitable habitat for 10 species at risk, potentially more given that the study was not site specific <laughs> with regard to individual species. It states that only five of the 10 species fall into the category of threatened or endangered, and that of those five endangered species, it concludes that they don't live, eat, or mate so much on the site as on the lands nearby the site. And again, I think I, it, 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 it's worth merit to point out that this was not a site-specific study. Consequently, the study determined that the development will not be in breach of environmental guidelines. This conclusion gives me pause. I mean, are we really meant to believe that a bat hunting for insects in the vicinity of the site will discriminate between insects available above the grasses on the site and those off the site? The study further states that because there is more foraging habitat elsewhere, the barn swallow will not be significantly impacted by the loss of habitat on the site. And that because there is no current habitat regulation in place for the bat species in question, no further analysis is required with regard to their protection, even though we know they are endangered. So is it that as stewards of this environment, we want to wait until there is little or no habitat left for a species before we decide to protect it? Do we want to base our decisions on a policy that waits until at-risk species are designated as endangered or threatened before we step up to protect them? In what way do these policies reflect environmental sustainability in the face of rapid urban growth? Meaford Municipality's official plan requires that development is prohibited within 120 meters of fish habitat, significant wildlife habitat, and habitat for threatened and endangered species. In Appendix 5.3 of the SkyDev Environmental Impact Study, it says that the northern boundary of the development exists between 5 meters to 95 meters from the shoreline of Georgian Bay. It also claims that the habitats where the five threatened or endangered species exist include the forested areas directly north of the proposed development. These woods, as many of you will know, live right between the north end of this proposed development and the shoreline. It then follows by my understanding that although this development has agreed to abide by the provincial guideline of 30 meters from streams, rivers, and lake bodies, as it is currently designed, it fails to adhere to our own local municipal standards for the protection of habitats. In fact, those put in place to value and protect our shores and their inhabitants, in particular those of our most vulnerable wildlife. I would like to suggest with respect that SkyDev be required to redesign its plan so that those north lying buildings are backed off from the woodlands and shoreline, giving those habitats some space to breathe and yes, thrive. A quick note now to the toxicity of the property. The impact study notes that there are several areas of potential environmental concern within the soil on site, including oil and petroleum solvents and PCBs. PCBs are a known carcinogen. PCBs are believed to travel through the air once evaporated from water and soil surfaces and can contaminate organisms via breathing, physical contact and consumption of water. PCBs also move from smaller fish to larger fish and accumulate in fat tissue, which in turn contaminate the individuals who consume that fish, be they birds, large mammals, or humans. I would like to know what methods of remediation have been proposed to deal with the existing soil contaminants and how we can be assured that a stirring up of the site soils will not result in further contamination of our air, creeks, and groundwater, which in turn flow into the bay contaminating the water and its occupants, and in turn, again, the fresh fish that winds up on our dinner table. I believe strongly that further study and attention is required in this area, and that the process agreed upon be further tabled to the Meaford community at large. This issue directly impacts the health of all of us. Finally, Thank you, Carrie. 
I have to move on now. I, could me. I just make mention of one quick thing is that the stewards of these lands and the original occupants, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as of May 5th, were still not informed that this development proposal was happening. And I think that's a massive oversight as well. Thank you. I believe we have heard from the, uh, from the Indigenous community on that. And we'll move on now. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Liz Harris, you're next. Yes, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, I know I'm pretty sure you're pretty tired tonight. You've been at it all day long. Um, I live in the former township of St. Vincent, uh, and I've been here for 17 years, but I've also lived on the waterfront in Meaford. And I've been a permanent resident here for over 24 years, and I've been here since I was four. So I have a vested interest in this community. I love it dearly. I've worked, volunteered with many, many groups over the years. Um, Harbor being one of them, downtown beautification, tourism, economic development, and on it goes heritage. Uh, and I'm also a Rotarian. Um, being involved with all of these groups has given me the inner workings of how this community mingles together. And I believe very strongly that our residents are not afraid of development, but they are depending on you, the council, and the staff to bring home good, well thought out development. And this proposed development is outrageous. If you look at, and you all have seen it tonight, it's something that would be in a city center where you take four or three corners of concrete and plunk it down. You've got on our beautiful harbor front we all know that our harbor is the gem of our community it is undiscovered and people do not want to have this atrocity put there i mean as a boater coming into the harbor greeting with ugly cement walls is just not appropriate and not a good use of land whatsoever we all know everyone has talked about it this evening that we're well over density four times density we don't have sight lines it's um, unsafe for children. There's more pavement than there is green space. So I don't understand why SkyDev, especially after they had their first uh, presentation in the winter, they were asked a number of questions and a lot of them being heritage, environment, green space, concrete, um, railroad, you know, all the sort of heritage and, and pertinent points of our community they really have not addressed any of those. And by calling this the Night Harbor, I'm sorry, that does not give us an in or make us even happy about that one. Um, we have an official plan that's been pulled together by staff, by council and by residents. And by not adhering to the terms of our official plan, we are basically snubbing all the people who put a lot of hard time and effort to create this plan. So this plan that of SkyDev is not compatible with Meaford at all. It's not speaking of our community. It's actually disparaging for our community. Um, I'm asking council, and I know that we've been looking for development for a long time and it's been sitting on the horizon and every time with economic de development, we'd get the stats and they'd say, oh yeah, you know, there's another development coming. Well, guess what? It's here now. Loons, uh, heart, loons um, on uh, the Hollett Highway is a, a good case in point where there was no public knowledge about this. The signage was an eight and a half by 11, which is not appropriate. And nobody knew about it until it was absolutely too late. We're in the same position with this one. No signage, not enough adequate knowledge for the surrounding community to have any idea what's going on. I really, really beg you to please get a vision for Meaford. Put these guys on hold. They do not need to be dictating what we need here. We need to understand what we need. We, the residents of Meaford, and you, the elected officials, have to adhere to what we need. So you have been asked quite a few times tonight to um, form a community input group. And I strongly, strongly suggest you do that so that the people in Meaford have an opportunity to say what they really want. We need development. There's no question about it, but not four times density. Absolutely not. And no one has ever even suggested about building single family dwellings on that site. 
Why can they not? Why can SkyDev not look into having something mixed rather than these stacked housing with five stories? I'm sorry, it's just, it's not appropriate. And let's go back to the drawing board, please make them go back and come up with something that protects the integrity of our community and speaks to the pride of we, the residents of Meaford. Thank you. Alan Reed is next, please. Yes, uh, uh, Your Worship and Council, uh, I'm going to be extremely brief because this has gone on a long time and I think we've heard a lot of the same issues over and yeah. over. Thank High you. Density, lack of green, screwing up the waterfront, no character for the Meaford. Tell these guys to go packing or come back with a better plan at much lower density. Thank you all. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Um, Karen. Coleman, you're next. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors and staff for another chance to um, voice my opinion. Um, when do so many people agree uh, uh, as, as over an issue like this? I think it's fantastic and inspiring and I think we can do great things together. So I have um, um, a question first for Carrie LaMarche, and then I have some comments to follow. May I ask Carrie some questions now? Is that appropriate? You can just ask a question and it, she won't answer now. We'll, uh, we'll get to okay. that later. Well, she promoted SkyDev as um, a company that um, is about clean energy and sustainable features. I'd like to know what exactly that means. Okay. And I'd also like to know what studies have been completed to prove you can build underground parking. And um, speaking of, of the parking, a third of the proposed development seems to be uh, overground parking and a third versus, versus two thirds. So the proportion is so out of whack to me that it makes no sense at all. Um, the whole development, in my point of view, is extremely ugly. It looks like something from Aurora. Um, I'm sure that, uh, or I would bet that um, the designs were just taken from their files um, without any real consideration of what, who Meaford, who, what, who is Meaford and what reflects our values our, and our architectural values. I'm really sorry that those buildings were torn down because we could have could have um, 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 rejuvenate, rejuvenated them at, like Toronto did with the distillery district and the evergreen complex in the Don Valley Parkway Valley. That would have been amazing. Um, uh, and also my last point is just about the landscaping. The landscaping is a high maintenance design. Um, with that kind of density, we're gonna, we're gonna see cigarette butts, uh, Tim Horton cups. I mean, you go anywhere, ev anywhere you go with high density, that's what you're going to see. And that's what's going to happen to the waterfront if, if we go with this plan, which I think would be a terrible idea. But speaking of designs, um, I, uh, someone said, let's have a, a showpiece design, architectural design. And so I would propose that SkyDev maybe throw, um, I'm gonna throw it, SkyDev um, initiate uh, an architectural uh, competition. It's a fantastic site. So let's see what the greatest creative minds um, um, can come up with to, um, to build in this site. Um, I, I, think, I think we need to do something like that. Um, so that's it. Good idea. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye. Bye-bye. And Alex Hector, you're next. Welcome Thank back. you, Mayor Clumpus and Council. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'll be very quick because I know it is late uh, and I admire your stick to it -iveness. Thank you. Um, so it strikes me as odd that in the middle of a tsunami of population movement to escape the density in the cities that a development company wants to put a Mississauga-like development right in the midst of our small community. Clearly, SkyDev has not considered the sensibilities that draw us to our beautiful small community. The public benefits in their proposal are not apparent to any of us tonight, 
and the proposal seems very greedy and way outside our official plan. I quote from the official plan, uh, the section on intensification targets, generally new construction through intensification should occur in a manner that takes into account the existing built and physical environment and be sympathetic in form. So two problems here. One is the words generally and should, and hopefully we'll firm that sort of language up as we revise our official plan. But secondly, the, the biggest problem, most important problem for today is that it's not taking into account the existing built and physical environment as we've heard tonight. It really feels like it's a Hollywood movie with the big city developer uh, running into town with the intention of steamrolling us uh, to maximize their profits. Um, I would ask um, Skydev, would you withdraw your proposal based on what you've heard tonight, uh, go back to the drawing board and come back to us with a proposal that appears that appeals to our sensibilities um, and better considers our official plan. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council. Thank you, Alex. And uh, moving on, Barry Ward, you're next. Yes, good evening. Uh, thank you, Mayor Klumpus, members of council, staff, SkyDev reps, and attendees for considering, considering the following questions. With the knowledge that this proposed development exceeds the height restrictions as per the official plan, why is the town hearing the developer's proposal as it exists presently. As regards the traffic impact study, what type amount and patterns of traffic are expected to be produced from and attracted to the site? What improvements will be required to the road networks that will serve this development? Will a site line study be done to gauge the impact this development will have to both local residents and to the town's official plan um, slash desired aesthetic? as detailed in said plan. Can the present capacity of treated water and sewage satisfy the needs of this development? With the waters of Georgian Bay a primary attribute of the community, it is paramount that sewage capacity not be exceeded for this or, an, or any other future development. Will stormwater and sewage lines be separated, uh, again, in the interest of uh, capacity with the sewage plant? Can the current electrical infrastructure support the added load required for this development and not threaten the long-term stable supply of electrical power to all residents and businesses in the municipality? Are the town of Meaford's emergency response services adequate to respond to a five-story structure? So in this case, it's my understanding, you would need a ladder that would be able to go six stories high so they could access the roof in the event of a fire. Um, how will the security of the additional residents occupying the development be ensured uh, when the town of Meaford has no local police force nor an existing contract with the Ontario Police, Provincial Police? Um, what is the expected average age of individuals who will reside in the development? Considering that numerous studies have been done throughout North America that show residential development is revenue neutral and often a financial liability for municipalities, who will pay for all the infrastructure upgrades expenses required to accommodate this development? In regards to uh, notifying property owners, I think the town needs to, for a development uh, in the nature such as this, it impacts all residents in the town. So I think that the notice should have been given to everybody in town for, again, for a development of this nature. Will a long-term flood impact study be performed? We have experienced the effects of high water levels in the Great Lakes Basin. Additionally, studies exist indicating that the cyclical nature of water levels will continue. However, those same studies suggest the overall trend in the basin is for higher water levels through the end of this century. What steps will be taken to assure any buildings associated and associated infrastructure will not be threatened by these higher water levels? What are the bona fides of the developer SkyDev? Will SkyDev commit to a performance bond and associated penalties as part of the proposal that details start and finish dates with the finish date defined as the building's ready for occupancy. Um, 
And, and just to comment on the, the, the size of the buildings, access to Georgian Bay is being restricted around the bay and you need no go no further than take a drive to Collingwood and look at the number of times you can actually see the water. And one of the reasons most people cite when uh, saying why they moved here is because of the vistas provided by being able to look out on the water. This development is gonna stop that ability or certainly impair it. Um, uh, in closing, uh, I'd like to comment on a um, Diane Hilliard, a speaker that that uh, commented earlier. She made the comment that this is a pivotal, pivotal piece of land. And I think that uh, she really hit the nail on the head with that comment. And um, the number of attendees uh, at this meeting tonight and the number of people giving deputations uh, and, and none of them that I've heard of are speaking positively about this development. So I would say that you as elected representatives of us, the people need to consider that fact uh, when you consider whether to go ahead with this development. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, uh, Trevor Hessel, you're next, please. Hi, good evening, Mayor Klumpus and Council. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be brief. I, I just want to be on the record as objecting to this development as well. Um, my concerns have been brought up by others with traffic density, safety, uh, the lack of green space, the environmental destruction. Um, you are elected officials. I plead to you to consider this property for the glorious piece of land that it is and to keep it as a majority of green recreational and environmental space. Um, and that's it for me. I'll keep it brief. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trevor. We appreciate your brevity. Next is Carol Pote. Pote? Uh, Carol, Carol's not with us. Carol's not with us. So last on the list is Kevin and Linda Thompson. Good job, honey. You didn't say the lipstick. No, I just I know. Oh, no. Go ahead, please. We um, can't hear. I'm not sure if it, it if it's them or not. Is this Kevin and Linda Thompson? Mm, I don't think it is then. This was our mystery guest from earlier on. So we're just I think we should move on, probably. Uh, I don't know who we're speaking. Who who's coming sorry, up next? Sorry, time. that's that was that's me, Derek. And uh, yes, I do Derek, have I realize that I had the last one unmuted here. No. So, have we completed our list then? I believe so. All right. Well, thank you all for coming tonight for your uh, remarks. Um, the passion, obviously, uh, certainly well understood and um, and and very valued. It's uh, it's important that uh, you participate in the public process, in the democratic process, and we value your participation. Um, I want to ask council first off if they have any comments uh, that they wish to make at this time. Um, we will have an opportunity at another time as well. Councillor Kentner. Thank you. Th through your worship, uh, I, if I understand we will be hearing from the proponents uh, shortly. So um, yes. I, I just would like to say that I, I, I noted minimal changes to the plan uh, in the months since uh, we first heard about it in January. And uh, uh, some people have suggested a couple of things. One was uh, organizing the townhouses in rows so that there would be uh, ways in which you could uh, view the water from Fuller and Bridge Street or Boucher Streets. Uh, and another that, uh, um, yeah, uh, is it possible to take these uh, apartment buildings uh, and put them on another uh, piece of land? Um, 
just I ideas to uh, deal with the, uh, the density and massing issues that, that people have been raising. And, and I did wonder just one more, uh, if, if there were a major storm event and it destroyed the waterfront, would the municipality actually be liable for damage to the SkyDev properties? So those are some questions for, for the proponents. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Rob, do you have any comments at this stage? Um, yeah, thank you, Risha. Um, not at this point. Obviously, we're the purpose of tonight is to hear hear the comments from the right. public. Um, the questions, I, I know the, the applicant will probably like to respond to them, whether it's this evening or get back to us uh, in more detail. Uh, I'm aware that they sometimes like to do that. Uh, in that regard, just a, a one point of clarification was raised tonight. I made this same mistake very early on in the process when it was mentioned that Skyline was looking to develop. Um, this is not the Skyline that is Horseshoe and the Blue Mountain Village. This is a different Skyline company um, and is not the hotel operator that um, they, they would probably correct that. But I um, I know that that was, was the case uh, as well. Um, one thing, a point of clarification for the public I'll quickly do is um, we didn't say or will consider the swap of land like for like. Uh, we realized that obviously one part of land is more valuable than the other. And part of that consideration will be the difference in value through proper appraisals. And that won't be considered and come to council until we determine that difference. So those are just a couple of municipal clarifications that I would make uh, that came out of the, the public process. Thank you, Rob. And Scott, I'll give you a chance to, if you have anything from the county's perspective. Yeah, similar to what Rob, oh, thank you, uh, uh, Mayor Compass. Similar to what Rob said, uh, I was mostly here tonight to listen and, and certainly happy to follow up with any of those that do have questions or concerns for the county and, and there'll be more opportunities to discuss. So thank you everyone for, for making your comments. Thanks, Scott. And now I'll turn over to, sorry, Rob. Sorry, I, one other thing I forgot to mention, and it came up with regard to the SON comment. Um, we did circulate to SON as we do every yes. application. Um, what I understand is there may have been a change at their end with regard to who we were circulating it to, uh, but we do have, have given it to them, and uh, we will not be proceeding until we do have that consultation element and comments from them. So I uh, just wanted to clarify that because I remember that did come up as well through the comments. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Um, and now we'll turn it back to the proponents uh, if for their final comments, if they have anything they wish to add now, or do you wish to uh, compile your question, your answers to the questions and uh, present them at a later date? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, you know, we're prepared to, I think, uh, address some of the, the larger and more frequently mentioned items. Um, but certainly I think we can, uh, you know, given the hour, uh, come back uh, later with, uh, with uh, any of the more detailed uh, answers, um, if that's, uh, if that's your, the preference. Um, I, I think that would be very welcome. Thank you. So please go ahead then. Not, not a problem. I think um, I, I first just want to thank everyone. I think um, we can agree that uh, this site is uh, what, uh, a great location and a great site. And we can also agree that Meaford is a fantastic community. Um, and so to that end, we have the same objective in mind uh, to create the development that Meaford needs and that, um, and that we, uh, we think will add to the community, uh, not subtract. I think you know density and height uh, and compliance with the OP were were common themes uh, throughout, um, and so I'd like to turn it over to Chris to maybe start on on some of those items, um, and then we can uh, we can tackle um, a couple of the others. Chris, Go ahead, Chris. You're... Sorry, the sorry, Mayor. The uh, um, coordinator had me muted. 
Uh, first of all, I want to thank the residents of Meaford who thoughtfully prepared their comments in response to the SkyDev proposal. We have much to consider. I'd like to just touch on two comments at this time. So first of all, we heard probably a dozen, maybe 20 times, the, the um, Gray County official plan, 20 units per hectare policy. And that, that policy says that for all other primary settlement areas, a minimum development density of 20 units per net hectare will be achieved for new development. So it's, it, it is a minimum. Scott um, Taylor identified that at the outset of the meeting. There are some locations where less than 20 units per hectare may be appropriate. And there are other locations where alternative densities greater than 20 units per hectare may be appropriate. And those need, need to be vetted on the merits of the application and other policies in place to evaluate those applications. We appreciate the opportunity to hear the comments from the residents. We believed, we believed in putting our presentation together that we meet the principles for redevelopment that are achieved in the, or identified in the special policy area one designation. But there's not one design for any given property. We put forward SkyDev's vision. We think that it, it ticked a lot of the boxes for those principles. Um, many of the comments from the residents, obviously they, they don't believe that, that we did meet the policies. So we have some more work to do with SkyDev's commitment to do so. And we will, we will come back to the public and, and council. We indicated there is a commitment to do so. This is not an easy site. It is a very important site. It's complex, it has history, it's contaminated and needs to be remediated. And there's a cost to that. And there needs to be a business model to, to balance those costs. There are a number of very common themes that the residents presented to us. And, and we'll take those themes back and provide a response, including how we believe, believe that we can achieve the principles of development in line with the, the resident's vision for the special policy area one designation. We will be back to you, council. Thank you very much, Mr. Pigeon. That's uh, welcome news for sure. Um, is there anything further, Carrie, or, or shall we? Uh... Yeah, I think just, you know, our, our commitment to, to take these comments back. I think we've looked at, you know, 24 or 25 different ways to lay out the site to minimize the uh, uh, impacts um, on all sides. And uh, we can look at 25 more. Um, you know, we, uh, we are not set on any one thing. And uh, can, certainly the, the feedback received, um, you know, will continue to, to take that into account along with the architecture and, uh, and the rest. Um, you know, we'd love to see a hotel on this development. We think it makes the development better to have a hotel as a part of it. Um, but um, to, to get a deal in place with a hotel, we really need the zoning in place uh, to permit it um, before we're really able to secure and move forward with any sort of hotel year. So wanted to make sure that that you know, commitment and, the, and, and, uh, and that the hotel makes the site better uh, that you guys heard that from us as well. You know, Chris mentioned that uh, remediation uh, is expensive. So, uh, but, but our objective here is really to keep the rents in the apartment buildings as low as possible. On average across Canada, our rental rate is $1,200 per unit. Um, but really the rental rates are established based on the, the cost associated divided by the number of units that you have. With the cost of upgrading the roads, the remediation of the site, um, putting underground parking in place, which, you know, a third of the parking right now is underground. We will put more underground if we are able to with the groundwater and bedrock levels, which we're currently looking at. Um, you know, it all, it all adds up. And so for us, the density really is um, a need in order to have a modest return on investment, but keeping rents low in those rental apartment buildings such that they are truly attainable for the community, average citizen in the community. Thank you very much, uh, Carrie, and thank you everyone for your uh, the time, your uh, participation, and uh, certainly uh, the comments that have forthcoming. Um, this uh, report, this will go back now to staff to um, uh, for development services to follow up on any additional information um, to gather together all of the comments that uh, folks have, have uh, graciously put forward. 
And once they are satisfied that uh, they have all the necessary information that will come to council. But as we've heard, there will be more opportunity for participation and uh, to explore the commitments that uh, SkyDev Corp has, uh, has uh, uh, committed for, to us tonight. So I wanna thank everybody again for participating and uh, for uh, this evening. It's been a long evening. Um, uh, we really value the community participation. Uh, just one other further note, if anybody would like to receive a mailed notice of a future decision on this file, I would ask that uh, your contact information uh, is uh, provided to the Legislative uh, Services Department. All of those who spoke, we have your information. But if anybody is still listening to us, um, if they would like any further information, they can let us know. With that, um, I, I believe we have uh, finished the business of uh, at hand, and I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you all very much for participating, and good night. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night.